and the story begins on the battlefield of world, where the protagonist finally reaches the ultimate stage of the prolonged battle, the Demon King's Castle. Entering the fortress, he finds it overrun with demonic forces loyal to the Demon King. Aware that the final confrontation is upon him, he spots the mighty Demon King on his throne. The Demon King, recognizing the hero's presence, admires his perseverance but cautions that the final battle, the showdown, is about to commence, ordering his minions to dispatch the intruder. As thousands of minions charge, the hero stands ready, unfazed by the advancing mass. He gears up for the impending clash, his resolve as firm as ever, poised for a monumental counterattack. Magic surges through his extended arm, propelling him towards the enemy, utilizing his mastery over arcane skills and combat strategy. He launches into action. His movements are fluid, dodging and striking with surgical precision, making full use of aim compensation to ensure not a single effort is wasted. His assaults are meticulously targeted, exploiting weaknesses with unmatched precision through strength penetration. Each hit delivers devastating impact, breaking through the defenses of many foes and overwhelming them in the turmoil. The battlefield serves as a testament to his unmatched skills, as he methodically defeats the demonic forces with supreme control over his abilities. The hero activates outburst acceleration, noting the unexpected number of the Demon King's minions. Despite the vast numbers, he skillfully performs the bullet dance, efficiently countering the imminent threat of the minions. The Demon King, witnessing the hero's steadfast resolve and seeing his formidable minions bested by a human, is profoundly shocked. This unexpected turn of events forces the Demon King to acknowledge the significant threat posed by this lone warrior. The Demon King's astonishment at the hero's ability to overcome such odds highlights the dramatic shift in the battle's dynamics setting the stage for a direct confrontation between the forces of darkness and a singularly determined hero. The recognition of the challenger as a formidable adversary compels the Demon King to act. With a threatening gesture, he elevates his spear, conjuring a powerful whirlwind of dark mana, and the sinister gem in his forehead emits a foreboding glow, unleashing a sudden onslaught of destructive mana, resembling a lightning strike directed at the protagonist. This assault, executed with exceptional quickness, surprises the hero, its velocity exceeding his anticipations. Fortuitously, he dodges the attack, realizing the narrow escape from what could have been a fatal outcome. In response to another formidable assault by the Demon King, the hero opts not just to evade but to strike back, firing at the demon with his weapon. Yet, the Demon King remains undisturbed by the attack, mockingly dismissing the effort as trivial for a mere human. With the demon initiating another attack, the hero observes that his attacks are being nullified by the Demon King's barrier, leading him to speculate on the veracity of rumors regarding the dark stone on the demon's forehead as a potential weak point. Amidst the turmoil, the hero resolves to breach the barrier by any means necessary. Despite his relentless endeavors, all efforts to penetrate the Demon King's defenses prove ineffective, as the demon conjures a protective shield around himself, rendering him seemingly invulnerable. With a display of sheer confidence, the Demon King belittles the hero's attempts, declaring his readiness to showcase the vast gulf in their powers through his superior magical capabilities. The Demon King summons a flurry of menacing mana orbs, hurling them at the protagonist in a coordinated assault. Caught by surprise, the hero finds himself hard-pressed to evade the relentless barrage. In a critical moment, one of the mana orbs strikes the hero squarely, causing his weapon to clatter to the ground. Amidst this, the Demon King mocks the hero, proclaiming that his modest attacks are futile against him. Despite the hero's vigorous efforts, the Demon King's disdain is rooted in his conviction that the protagonist, a mere player, stands no chance against his formidable power. In an unexpected twist, the player regains the upper hand by conjuring a new weapon via a magical circle, resolute to challenge the Demon King's assertion of invulnerability. The player boldly announces their determination to counteract this claim. With a voice full of resolve, they unleash the Moonlight Bullet, targeting the Dark Stone Barrier protecting the Demon King. To the astonishment of all, the bullet fractures the barrier, disrupting what was thought to be unbreakable. This breach incites the Demon King's fury, who then vehemently vows that the player's end will be by his own formidable power, releasing a torrent of sinister mana around him. Caught in the Demon King's intense onslaught, the player faces the grim reality of the situation, contemplating the imminent risk posed by this overwhelming force. Confronted with the stark choice of all-out effort or certain defeat, the player taps into a deep well of determination, quickly employing the consecutive shot compensation technique for a relentless volley intended to breach the Demon King's defenses. In a critical moment, the player calls upon their ultimate ability, Dawn's Judgment, unleashing a torrent of power that dispels the dark mana surrounding them and bathes the battlefield in a luminous glow, overpowering the malevolent aura of the Demon King. As the light envelops the demon, 
The player capitalizes on this advantage, delivering a crucial strike aimed at the Demon King's head. The precision of the attack ensures the end of the tyrant's cruel dominion, marking a triumphant victory over darkness. Upon the Demon King's defeat, the game concludes with the player standing victorious, having surmounted a plethora of challenges and foes to secure victory, thereby ending the epic saga. The young gamer, engaged in world virtue magic marksman, expresses delight, surprised by the effectiveness of the magic skills encountered. Motivated by this experience, he decides to opt for the mage character in the forthcoming World 3 update, anticipating new adventures with enhanced magical capabilities. Faced with the prospect of creating a conventional mage, the player decides to explore the unique karma system within the game, which allows for the acquisition of enhanced abilities at the expense of certain drawbacks. This system, often avoided by many due to its inherent risks, captures his interest with the promise of gaining superior stats despite the accompanying negative traits. Embracing the chance to craft a mage of unparalleled power, he selects a series of challenging traits such as Puppet, Insomnia, Mana Addiction, Chronic Headache, and Life Draining Talent for his mage. His strategy focuses on maximizing magic-related stats, aiming to forge the ultimate mage undeterred by the character's resultant frail appearance. The player's indifference to the character's health issues stems from his view that it's merely a game character, prioritizing unique abilities and the thrill of the game over conventional character development. Suddenly, an unexpected voice startles him awake. Upon opening his eyes, he is astonished to discover that he is transformed into the mage character he had just created. He finds himself in an alien room, vastly different from any place he's known, transformed into the mage he meticulously designed in the game. His bewilderment intensifies upon this realization, struggling to comprehend this abrupt and mystifying change in his identity and location. To mind races back to the last thing he remembers, the loading screen of the game, displaying the cryptic message, first is a coincidence, second is inevitable, and third is fate. Following the disappearance of the loading screen, a consuming blacklight engulfed him, and he succumbed to a forceful pull, as if being drawn inside. Abruptly, his reverie is broken by a man roughly pulling him from his slumber, vociferously inquiring when Lena will awaken. The man aggressively slaps his face, sending him tumbling off the bed. Surveying his surroundings, the boy notices a crowd of onlookers. It dawns on him that he has become the frail character he had created in the game, a realization that sinks in with a mix of irony and dismay. The man harshly orders him to dash to the parts assembly, room and departs, leaving the boy to face the ridicule of his peers. They just about his oversleeping, with one quipping dismissively, let him be. He's bound to meet his end soon enough, and when he does, the supervisor will catch it too. Suddenly, the supervisor's stern directive to move quickly startles everyone into compliance. The supervisor then turns to an employee named Van, inquiring if the order for the Viper has been placed. The individual acknowledges, affirming the delivery of the Viper upon its arrival. As they disperse, the boy reflects on being addressed as Lino, recognizing it as a character he designed for gaming enjoyment. Yet, he struggles to accept his current predicament, trapped in this feeble form. Three days have elapsed since he awoke in what appears to be a factory setting, a place unfamiliar and daunting. Surprisingly, Lino adapts swiftly to the factory's rigorous daily schedule, starting work before dawn and continuing until near collapse. Each night, his only sustenance is a bowl of rice porridge, barely recognizable as edible. Attempts to engage with fellow workers are futile. The reluctance to communicate stems not only from the constant pressure of supervision, but also from a resigned perception of him as already doomed. Neo doubting his ability to endure the harsh conditions with such a frail physique, inadvertently drops a carton he was carrying. The supervisor bear at him severely, labeling him as utterly useless and demanding, he retrieved the dropped item. Lino quickly offers an apology, but he is suddenly seized by intense coughing fits, sparking concern among his co-workers. Viewing Lino as nothing more than a nuisance on the brink of death, the supervisor decides he should be out of sight. He instructs Van to move Lino to a secluded area, then delivers a kick to Lino's face, impatiently telling him to remove himself from their busy environment and suggesting he meet his end elsewhere, away from their operations. In the face of dire circumstances, Lino credits his ability to maintain his mental fortitude to the resilience and determination he imbued in his character. Despite the numerous ailments and weaknesses afflicting his body, he discovers that his magical talent remains intact. Lino is convinced that if he can tap into and utilize his inherent magical powers, he may find a way to extricate himself from his dire situation. Eyeing the exit, he ponders the feasibility of making an escape attempt. Yet, he recognizes that a successful escape requires a thorough understanding of the facility's layout and structure, a task he knows he must undertake cautiously and meticulously. Lino stealthily makes his way to the door, 
benefiting from the fact that he's largely ignored by others. As he enters, he finds himself in a corridor, noticing another door ajar. Curious, he edges closer to this partially open door, peeking outside to gather clues about his surroundings. He listens in as two factory workers discuss the recent influx of newcomers, criticizing their slow pace. One worker voices frustration over the low expectations from these so-called leftovers, suggesting that harsher discipline might improve their productivity. The conversation shifts to the urgency of fulfilling an order for the union by the day after tomorrow, sparking a debate over the union's intentions with their products. Van, one of the workers, reveals that the union repurposes their shredder for sale to the Black Mage, highlighting the dark underbelly of their operations. Lino is intrigued to overhear the mention of a Black Mage, affirming the presence of magic in this realm. He wonders about his ability to harness such power. Absorbing the conversation, Lino learns of a new enhancement called Viper introduced by Van. It's described as a product from Calvin and Cubs, notable for a novel filter that lessens its toxicity. This detail about the Viper, particularly its mana content, immediately draws Lino's interest, hinting at its magical essence. As he focuses on this revelation, a sudden change occurs, his eyes shift to a vivid blue, and his body begins to radiate with mana. It feels as though an internal explosion has unlocked a surge of energy within him. This awakening serves as the discovery of his sixth sense, or what could be termed the third eye. Lino comes to understand that this new awareness is, in fact, his alter ego, unveiling a layer of reality previously unnoticed. He recognizes that this vital force, the essence of existence itself, has always permeated the world around him, flowing through the air and now infused in every breath he takes. Clenching his fist, he acknowledges this newfound power as the magic intrinsic to this world, both alien and yet oddly familiar to him. That night, as the factory falls quiet with the rest of the workers asleep, Lino, wrapped in his blanket, contemplates the possibility of escape, but wide by the substantial mana he now wields. Reflecting on the conversation about the upcoming visit from union members, Lino deduces that their arrival might lead to a temporary relaxation in the factory's security protocols. This potential oversight presents him with a strategic opening for escape. He meticulously considers how to exploit this chance while remaining inconspicuous. By mimicking the appearance of fever through the manipulation of light and heat on his skin, he could convincingly appear ill, thereby avoiding unwanted attention and gaining the solitude needed for his escape. Meanwhile, Van approaches the supervisor's office, knocking with purpose. He announces his arrival, delivering the Viper previously mentioned, moving forward with their internal operations. This parallel development highlights the ongoing dynamics within the factory, juxtaposing Lino's quest for freedom against the backdrop of the workers' mundane tasks. The supervisor praises Van for his steadfast commitment and offers him the Viper as a gesture of recognition. Initially hesitant, Van is persuaded to accept the gift following the supervisor's insistence, who highlights Van's unwavering dedication to his duties as the basis for this reward. The supervisor, demonstrating a decisive stance, presents the Viper as a symbol of gratitude for Van's consistent and efficient execution of tasks. Subsequently, the conversation shifts towards Lino, with the supervisor expressing concern over his frail appearance and potential demise. He instructs Van to manage Lino discreetly emphasizing the importance of maintaining a polished image in anticipation of the union member's visit. Van agrees to follow through with the directive. As dawn breaks the next day, the alarm signals the beginning of a new day. As the day dawns signaling the arrival of the union members, the workers quickly stir from their sleep, rushing to prepare amidst whispers that the supervisors are likely to be more irritable than usual. Their focus abruptly shifts to Lino, whose profuse sweating suggests a grave illness. Concern spreads among them, with some speculating about the possibility of his demise and the ensuing need for cleanup. Lino, feigning sickness, silently gauges the situation, noting the effectiveness of his ruse as it successfully diverts attention from him. Van's arrival on the scene prompts an assumption among the workers that he intends to discreetly remove Lino from the premises. This observation aligns with the earlier directive, illustrating the workers' anticipation of Van's actions based on the supervisor's instructions, further embedding Lino's strategy within the day's unfolding events. One of the workers decisively instructs the others to commence their day's labor, suggesting that dwelling on the current scene would only bring them misfortune. Meanwhile, Lino is puzzled by the implication of Van's intentions to send him off, a development that strays from his original escape strategy. When Van approaches, he firmly hands Lino the Viper, clarifying its role as a body enhancer designed to temporarily augment his physical capabilities. Despite its modest cost, Van assures Lino of its sufficiency for the journey ahead. Upon ingesting the Viper, Lino experiences a remarkable surge within him, as mana begins to emanate from his body, signifying a dramatic increase in vitality that he hadn't anticipated from such a simple enhancer. 
This unexpected boon leads him to reassess his circumstances, especially considering Van's earlier actions. Armed with this new strength and a deeper understanding of his situation, Lino contemplates a revised strategy for his escape, adapting to the evolving scenario with newfound resolve and capabilities. In the factory's basement at the loading dock, workers are engrossed in loading cargo into containers. Concurrently, a union council member is in a heated discussion with a factory representative, highlighting discrepancies in the loaded product count. He claims credit for the factory's continued operations, mentioning leniency towards the workers due to an ongoing investigation by the Human Rights Commission, emphasizing the need for genuine actions. In response, the factory supervisor hastily offers an apology. The tension escalates with the union members' demands, causing unease among the supervisors. Amid this charged atmosphere, Lino, carrying a container, unexpectedly approaches another supervisor. He explains his predicament on an assignment to visit the director's office. He found it locked. Lino then requests the supervisor's assistance in unlocking the office, introducing an unexpected turn in the day's proceedings. The supervisor, clearly overwhelmed, snaps at Lino for interrupting his busy schedule, demanding to know the nature of Lino errand. Upon hearing it involves the Viper, the supervisor, albeit reluctantly, decides to escort Lino to the director's office, instructing him to follow. En route, the supervisor vents his frustration, questioning why a task of such nature was assigned to Lino and expressing bewilderment at Lino's involvement. Upon reaching the office, the supervisor quickly unlocks the door, urging Lino to complete his task swiftly. In a sudden turn of events, Lino, channeling his mana, incapacitates the supervisor using a mana bolt, rendering him unconscious. Lino then retrieves the keys from near the supervisor's feet, his intentions now focused on locating the Viper. His search unexpectedly yields a gun and a jacket, which he promptly takes possession of, ready to further his escape plan with these new acquisitions. In his search, Lino finds the Viper hidden under the bed, amazed by its capacity to eliminate fatigue and pain instantly. Securing one, he appreciates its significant potential, which was his primary goal. Suddenly, another supervisor, known for his harsh treatment towards Leno, stumbles upon the scene, alarmed by the scent of Viper. He storms in, demanding to know who's taking a break, only to discover his colleague Mark unconscious on the floor. Caught off guard but not deterred, Leno prepares to use his magic against this new adversary. The supervisor narrowly dodges the attack, shocked to see Leno wielding magic. Realizing his mana is too depleted for another magical assault, Lino quickly adapts to the situation. As the supervisor charges, intending to confront Lino directly, Lino draws the gun he found earlier, aiming it at the supervisor who immediately stops in his tracks, re-evaluating the threat before him. The supervisor, his hands raised in surrender, pleads for peace and dialogue. He apologizes for his past mistreatment, explaining he was only following orders and had no other choice. He promises to keep Leno's secret if spared, but Leno doubts the sincerity of his words. Amidst this, a voice from outside calls for Supervisor Ad, adding tension. Lino silences the supervisor, signaling him to remain quiet. The supervisor then discreetly suggests an escape route for Lino, pointing to a door that leads to the basement parking as a way out. Despite the supervisor's assurances, Lino is wary, uncertain whether to trust his guidance or contemplate the gravity of potentially using the gun against him. The colleague curious about Ad's silent suspect. He might be asleep and decides to check the director's room. Upon entry, he is met with a scene that leaves him in utter disbelief. Meanwhile, Lino makes a quick escape in the car through the basement, catching a worker off guard who initially mistakes him for Mark. When Lino stops the car and points the gun at him, demanding the door be opened, the worker, identified as Van, is overcome with fear and agrees to comply, begging Lino not to shoot. Shortly after, Van nervously announces that the gate is open for Lino to make his getaway. Simultaneously, the supervisor investigating Ad's absence in the director's room stumbles upon a shocking discovery and frantically reaches out to Van via walkie-talkie, instructing him to secure the exit immediately, indicating a sudden, intense shift in the factory's atmosphere. Hearing the exchange over the walkie-talkie and sensing the imminent threat to his freedom, Lino watches as Van, in a panic, switches off the device. However, Lino, prioritizing his escape over potential future risks, decides to eliminate Van, concluding that leaving him alive would pose a significant obstacle. This action driven by a blend of survival instinct and strategic foresight, showcases Lino's exceptional mental fortitude and ability to remain composed under pressure. As he continues his escape, Leno encounters another gate. Instead of stopping, he accelerates, breaking through the barrier with the car. This moment of decisiveness underlines a key aspect of his character, Amaj's talent for maintaining clarity and calmness in dire situations. 
reinforcing the notion that his unique capabilities extend beyond the realm of magic into the essence of his being. In dramatic scene at the H's building, a cloaked figure evades security, dodging bullets as he makes a daring escape. Facing a window and with no other options, he leaps through it, stunning the security team with his audacity. They speculate that such a fall would be fatal, prompting the security chief to order a ground search for what he believes will be the man's remains, evidenced by a fragment of clothing caught on the broken window. Meanwhile, Lino arrives in the magical engineering city of Balan, marveling at its vivid departure from the world he knew in World 2. Here, everything is subtly infused with mana, lending the city a unique energy and vibrancy. Lino senses the same kind of power he encountered in the factory, suggesting a significant role of mana in the civilization of this new world. Despite his wonder, the exhaustion from his intense escape efforts weighs heavily on him, highlighting the physical toll of his journey thus far. Lino, feeling the weight of his exhaustion, considers using the Viper to regain his strength. However, after a moment of reflection, he opts to conserve the limited supply for genuine emergencies. Discarding his vehicle to avoid pursuit, he makes his way on foot to a hostel, a journey that takes him an hour. Grateful for the absence of followers, he looks forward to a period of rest. Upon reaching the hostel, Leno's only desire is to surrender to the comfort of the bed and recuperate from his ordeal. Yet, the toll of his recent escapades proves too much. Overwhelmed by fatigue, he barely steps into the room before his strength gives out, and he collapses into unconsciousness, unable to enjoy the rest he so desperately sought. The next morning, Lino awakens to an intense thirst. He stumbles to the refrigerator and finds solace in a can of water, which momentarily revitalizes him. However, this relief is short-lived as a wave of nausea overcomes him, propelling him towards the sink where he succumbs to vomiting. Seated on the floor, overwhelmed by a sensation of his head splitting and his muscles aching as if on the verge of tearing, he gazes at his shaking hands, pondering if this distress might stem from the viper's aftereffects. Despite his unsettling condition, Lino recognizes the harsh reality that relying on such stimulants might be imperative for sustaining his physical capabilities. This acknowledgement underscores the challenges he faces, balancing the need for strength with the toll it exacts on his body. Realizing the nausea might be due to hunger after not eating for over 12 hours, Lino quickly eats a canned meal from the refrigerator, though he finds the taste lacking. Amidst this, the room's phone rings, and hotel management informs him he has two hours left until checkout. They inquire about extending his stay, and upon Lino's agreement, they detail the costs, accommodation at 200,000 cell, and the canned food at 20,000 cell. After subtracting his initial payment of 100,000 cell, they inform Lino his remaining balance is 120,000 cell, which needs to be settled today. Surprised by the high cost of the canned food, Lino calculates his finances, realizing he has 130,000 cell on hand. After settling his bill, he will be left with just 10,000 cell. This financial reckoning highlights the practical challenges he faces, balancing his immediate needs against the dwindling resources at his disposal. Facing the grim reality of his dwindling funds, Lino acknowledges he can't afford another night's stay to blend in and potentially avoid recognition. He decides to cut his long hair, a small but significant attempt to alter his appearance. Once outside the hotel, he finds himself in an alley, weighed down by the realization that earning money through conventional means might be unfeasible without a legal identity in this world. In a moment of desperation, Lino concocts a plan to target criminals, rationalizing that confiscating their money might provide him with the resources he needs without attracting undue attention or future repercussions. Empowered by this decision, he sets out to locate these wrongdoers, leveraging his ability to manipulate mana to aid in his search, marking a new chapter in his quest for survival. Lino concentrates magical energy in his ears, enabling him to overhear nearby conversations. He learns that a new engineer at Palmer's, tasked with examining a fresh aid for defects, has disappeared and a search for an agency is underway. Disinterested in these exchanges, Lino ignores the irrelevant chatter. He then catches a conversation of interest, where a villain requests the delivery of pilfered funds to a specific location. Captivated by the dialogue concerning the misappropriated money, Lino proceeds to the indicated area. During his pursuit, Lino suddenly feels dizzy, causing him to falter. Frustrated by his physical limitations, he quickly takes the Viper Potion. This action instantly revitalizes his strength and energy, enhancing his determination. With his motivation renewed, Lino is now eager to proceed with his objective to acquire wealth with renewed enthusiasm. At the destination, two thugs confront a terrified individual, demanding he repeat their earlier instructions. Shaking with fear, the man responds that completing their task would ensure no issues arise. One thug attacks him for misplacing the stolen funds, yet the distressed man earnestly claims he is truthful, explaining the money vanished en route. Discovering the man's lack of funds, 
the miscreants concoct a terrifying scheme to compensate for the shortfall. They intend to sell his body parts to recoup their illicit earnings, while the man's cries for rescue resound in desperation. In a prompt and decisive action, Lino steps in just as the villains are about to execute their dreadful plan. With his mystical powers, he casts an energy bolt that subdues and neutralizes the menacing foes, thwarting their malevolent plot. Nonetheless, this display of force frightens the victim, who, alarmed by Lino's intervention, implores him for protection. Caught off guard by this sudden shift, the man's appeal for safety mirrors his apprehension and bewilderment in the turmoil. Ignoring the man's pleas, the protagonist retrieves nearly 700,000 cell from the pockets of the incapacitated delinquents. Recognizing the substantial amount, Lino reflects on the opportunity to purchase clothing and medication. As he acquires the device from the thug's grip, the anxious man pleads for Lino not to aim it at him. He quickly clarifies that it's a modified Dykes Lays cutter, designed for legitimate use, but illicitly modified into a weapon. Realizing his potential for self-defense, Lino secures the gadget in his jacket as a precautionary tool. Attempting to establish control, Lino instructs the young man to keep the day's events confidential. Before he can complete his directive, the youth, shaking with fear, interjects passionately, promising to maintain silence about the day's occurrences, vowing to keep the incident a secret from all. The man's apprehension and dread of potential consequences are palpable as he implores for mercy, committing to absolute discretion regarding the episode. Lino, with a piercing look, shows his doubt despite the man's vows, feeling the strain, the man quickly proposes his help, asking if Lino needs anything further. Recognizing the man's edginess, Lino clarifies that being new to the city, he's on the lookout for information on jobs or activities that do not demand identification, preferably those involving magic. That evening, the protagonist reaches the venue described by the man, which appears to be a conventional bar. Anticipating it might be a cover, he opts to conceal his true identity. Utilizing his magical prowess, he skillfully alters his appearance and hair, aware of the necessity to rely solely on himself in this alien environment. Upon entering the bar, Lino is questioned by the bartender regarding his preference, to which he requests a mild beverage. As his order is prepared, Lino initiates a casual dialogue, revealing his quest for employment. He probes whether there is a demand for a mage or any assignments necessitating magical skills. While Lino anticipates the bartender's feedback on employment opportunities suitable for a mage, a young woman intervenes, signaling that the business hours have ended. She inquires about his presence, prompting the bartender to explain that the visitor claims to be a mage. Surprised that Leno does not match the traditional mage profile, the woman observes that he doesn't resemble one. Nonetheless, recognizing the rarity of mages, she admits that looks might not always correlate with capability. She introduces herself as Jenny and seems more receptive, welcoming Leno despite his atypical mage demeanor. Hiding his true identity, Leno presents himself as Van, unable to reveal his actual name. Jenny requests him to disclose his skills, emphasizing that she would not be impressed if he identifies as a mage while possessing only basic magical knowledge. At that precise moment, Jenny observed our hero manipulating a cluster of energy in his hands, which transformed into electricity. Instantly, she recognized this as an exceptionally rare form of magic, especially since our hero had conjured it without any magic circle. Realizing the extent of his abilities, she promptly offered him a contract for employment when inquired about the type of work he sought, our hero clearly stated his principles against deceit, expressing willingness to undertake any other tasks. Jenny, delighted by this response, revealed her intention to hire him as a hunter. She then presented him with a badge depicting his new role. She elaborated that his predecessor, a janitor, had absconded three days prior after attempting to pilfer Achilles' security apparatus. Our hero's compensation would be contingent upon the successful completion of his duties. Our hero inquired about the reason for his capture, given that he had only attempted and not succeeded in the theft. He was informed that a typical janitor would not have had the capability to breach the security system, and that all other janitors had met their demise. Jenny clarified that this was the reason Achilles had mandated his capture. Furthermore, since the manager to whom he was accountable had chosen not to intervene, both he and Jenny would encounter no difficulties. Our hero, having stepped outside, mulled over Jenny's promise regarding his compensation. The notion of being rewarded with three million seals for capturing a mere rat seemed insufficient to him. At that moment, as he glanced at the scoreboard, he pondered whether additional information about the man was available, thinking that more data could potentially increase his reward. Jenny could indeed provide the sought-after information, yet she was puzzled by his interest. She wondered if he intended to employ blood magic for the capture, advising against it, due to the excessive demands often made by those seeking a five million seal reward for such tasks. However, 
Our hero had no intention of resorting to blood magic, considering the use of simple spells sufficient for the task at hand. Our hero recalled that the conventional magic from his past experiences, particularly from World 2.0, remained effective in his new environment. He identified the hunter-class magic known as Blood Chase from version 2.0 as the most appropriate for his current assignment. Activating this spell with a fragment of the fugitive janitor's clothing, a serpent of a bloody shade emerged from the portal, immediately darting off in an odd direction which our hero pursued. Approaching the unsuspecting man from behind, the janitor remained oblivious until our hero called out his name. Startled, the janitor fled, bewildered by how he had been discovered. Our hero, prepared for confrontation, realized physical engagement might not ensue. Despite his readiness, the pursuit proved challenging due to his frail condition and his skepticism towards the efficacy of long-range attacks lingered. Our hero conjured a structure resembling a mushroom with a blue glow in his palm, believing this capability would prove beneficial in the conflict. Consequently, he deployed the sound wave skill. The spinning mushroom morphed into a magical blast that incapacitated the fleeing janitor. Collapsing to the ground and clutching his ears, the janitor experienced severe discomfort, likely from ruptured eardrums caused by the potent skill. Our hero, standing over him, remarked on the futility of his escape attempt. However, their confrontation was interrupted by a projectile intercepted by a protective aura. It became evident to our hero that they were not alone, suggesting the presence of a hidden sniper nearby. Relieved to have successfully erected a protective shield, our hero, however, could not dismiss the oversight of failing to detect the incoming shot. Recognizing the need for enhanced defenses, he prepared to fortify his barrier, aiming to withstand even an anti-tank missile for a brief duration. Encased in a blue aura shielding him from external threats, our hero still faced the challenge of locating the sniper. Implementing a scanning ability revealed no presence within a one-kilometer radius, suggesting the possibility of the shooter employing undetectable camouflage or perhaps targeting not him, but the janitor attempting to escape. This discrepancy led our hero to suspect an underlying anomaly as the sniper's focus seemed misdirected away from him. Our hero surmised that the objective was to permanently silence the janitor, a task unrelated to him directly but designed to thwart his mission. Despite having his weapon aimed at the janitor, our hero was simultaneously determined not to allow the sniper, intent on eliminating his target, to succeed unchallenged. Upholding the reputation of Van Hunter was paramount. Allowing the janitor to be assassinated on his watch would tarnish his image. By taking decisive action against the janitor himself, our hero reasoned that projecting an aura of ruthlessness would deter others from obstructing his path. The sniper, caught off guard by this unexpected turn of events, momentarily dropped his guard, resulting in the inadvertent reveal of his position as his camouflage failed. Our hero's senses were heightened. He detected the sniper's presence on the roof, his mana surging in strength following the elimination of his target. The sniper, uncertain if he had been visually detected, remained cautious. Meanwhile, our hero, without hesitation, conjured a mass of electrical energy in his palm, ready to unleash it over a span not exceeding a kilometer. Familiar with the spell to the extent of mastery beyond the need for sight, he summoned an electrical attack akin to lightning. The sniper, puzzled by our hero's actions, noticed the skies above growing ominously dark as thunderclouds gathered, and lightning began to manifest. Our hero completed the incantation of Call of Thunder, a spell that struck the sniper with precision. Our hero was astounded by the magnitude of the power he wielded, recognizing it as vastly superior to anything encountered in the game. This realization brought an additional perk. He could now proclaim himself a lightning mage. Ascending to the roof where he had unleashed the thunderous force, he surveyed the extensive damage. The devastation was remarkable. Pausing to catch his breath, he acknowledged the strain of deploying such potent magic. In his search for the sniper's remains, he found nothing, leading to the conclusion that the sniper had vanished. Acknowledging the sniper's extraordinary nature, our hero decided it was futile to pursue him any further. Our hero believed that his recent display of power would sufficiently deter any unwarranted curiosity. His primary objective was for his alias to become renowned throughout the city as a wielder of lightning magic. Upon his return to the establishment, which was in a state of disrepair, he was met with astonished gazes from the inebriated patrons. The elder was notably dismayed, pointing out that a more discreet entrance through the back would have been preferable for making such a dramatic revelation with the adversary's remains. He suggested a future use of the rear entry for such purposes, but agreed to address that matter later. Subsequently, the elder and our hero found themselves in an unusual room, prepared to discuss the next steps. The elder instructed our hero that for future assignments, he should use this specific room and entryway. He admitted that the oversight was his, attributing it to his age, and apologized for not informing our hero sooner. He requested our hero to wait, 
As he was close to completing his examination of the task, our hero showing patience, did not rush the elder. Upon opening the bag containing the body, the elder discovered that their target had succumbed to a firearm, not magic, confirming it was indeed their intended mark. Curious, our hero inquired if the elder was a pathologist, a question to which the elder hesitated to respond, abruptly changing the subject. The elder inquired whether our hero wished to receive his 2.7 million seal reward immediately, with no deductions, or preferred an alternative method of payment. Uncertain about the options. Our hero listened as the elder elaborated on possibilities like depositing the funds into a fictitious account or converting them into shares, hinting at the complexities of money laundering. Surprised, our hero reflected on the similarity of financial regulations in the Balkans to those in the real world. At that moment, Jenny entered, expressing astonishment at our hero's swift accomplishment. She lightly teased about his urgent need for quick payment, noting that the usual protocol involved more time spent on locating than on the actual elimination of a target. Curious about his efficiency, she questioned his secret to such rapid success. Our hero, choosing not to divulge his methods, attributed it to sheer luck. Jenny, sensing the evasion in his response, chose not to press further, instead acknowledging our hero's potential by stating their intention to collaborate with him on a long-term basis. Eager for more work, our hero expressed his readiness for additional tasks. However, Jenny indicated that immediate new assignments were not forthcoming due to other pressing matters that required attention, including reporting to Achilles and familiarizing themselves with the tasks of cleaners. When our hero questioned their trust in him, Jenny explained that while they were aligned, building complete trust would necessitate time, likening the process to dating. Despite sensing underlying issues, our hero decided it was best to depart. Upon his exit, a bearded individual informed Jenny of discoveries made through janitorial networks about our hero's methods. Jenny, reviewing the data on a tablet, was taken aback by what she saw. Meanwhile, our hero, not dwelling on these matters, proceeded to the nearest library to delve deeper into the magic system of this new realm. He was determined to uncover ways to extend his, and by extension, his character's lifespan, especially since his abilities came with a significant cost. A dwindling life force, akin to water escaping through one's fingers. Our hero delved into the study of time-related magic, anticipating the discovery of advanced magical practices. Upon reaching the library's reading room, he selected several volumes offering comprehensive analyses of various spells and their uses. Immersed in research, our hero experimented firsthand, adjusting his own mana structure to gain insights. The complexity of such manipulations led him to marvel at the prowess of archmages capable of altering these forces. In a moment of curiosity, he chose to expel some mana from his system, observing a fascinating phenomenon the pattern on his hand, transformed in response to the amount of mana he channeled into it. This observation opened new avenues for exploration in his quest, to understand the magic system of this unfamiliar world. Our protagonist was uncertain of his level, yet he succeeded in altering mana structures, which brought him great joy. He had thoroughly reviewed all materials borrowed from the library, feeling somewhat dismayed by the discrepancy between his preconceived notions and the information presented. This led to an immediate transformation in his understanding. He learned that magical practices could be classified into two main types, common and unique. Unique magic, accessible to each sorcerer, is noted for its specialization and heightened potency. Conversely, common magic, while less powerful than its unique counterpart, boasts a vast array of applications, transcending specific attributes and objectives. This was the prevailing system in our protagonist world 2.0. Our protagonist was perplexed by his ability to wield common magic without any prior reference to it in his studies. Despite his inherent talent, he realized he couldn't redefine the essence of magic or invent abilities beyond those documented. Exhaustive reading left him with more questions than answers, especially a notable absence of information on time-related magic. A young woman approached him, questioning his resolve but suggesting he was destined to become a formidable mage. This idea puzzled him. He couldn't grasp her meaning, though she spoke of enduring hardship and clinging to hope. Confusion enveloped our hero. The young woman's intrusion puzzled him. She mistakenly believed he aspired to become a magician through self-study, yet deemed him unsuccessful. She suggested that, given his age, pursuing magical engineering might be more prudent than the elusive path of a mage. Admission to a prestigious academy was essential for such a journey. She explained, implying that his independent studies would scarcely suffice for entrance, let alone mastery. Merely attending lectures, she argued, would not bridge the gap his self-education had created. Magic, after all, demanded both innate talent and fortuitous circumstances. Despite any determination he might possess, she implied that his efforts were likely to be in vain. Turning her gaze back to him, she revealed a hint of embarrassment, questioning her own impulse to disclose so much. 
Her final words were a gentle remind me. The library's impending closure necessitated the return of the books, and it was time for him to depart. Seated at the table, our hero inquired if her advice stemmed from personal experience. Her evident surprise was met with his assertion that it was premature to concede defeat. He advocated for exploring every conceivable avenue before considering surrender. As he prepared to depart, the woman approached, presenting him with her card. She promised a demonstration of her magic upon his next visit, leaving him puzzled by her perception of him as the peculiar one. Upon examining the card, he discovered it bore the name of the university and identified the woman as Professor Ares Richland, a revelation that added layers to her previous counsel. As our hero strolled through the streets, he marveled at the idea of such a young woman holding the title of professor, especially when she appeared younger than himself. Catching his reflection in a window, he decided it was the opportune moment to purchase some groceries. Heading to the bustling market, he was reminded of the benefits of cooking for oneself, a healthier lifestyle choice. His contemplation was abruptly interrupted by a police officer, who was requesting all individuals in the market to verify their identities by placing their fingers for a scan. Our hero felt a surge of alarm at the situation, but chose to remain composed, recognizing he wasn't the target of their search. Suddenly, a woman's voice interrupted his thoughts, questioning whether he was engaging in unlawful activities. She had observed his cautious behavior during the mana sample verification and suspected his involvement in something dubious. Our hero realized that in this new world, mana served a similar purpose to fingerprints, a unique identifier for individuals. The woman inquired about his presence there. Recalling his initial errand, he mentioned he had nearly missed the shop he intended to visit, preoccupied with his thoughts. He questioned whether she was new to the shop, recalling a different attendant previously. The woman clarified that she was not merely an employee but the owner of the shop. Responding to his comment on her presumed wealth, she replied in a manner unique to her. Our hero was left pondering whether her words were in jest as her demeanor puzzled him. The shop owner inquired if he wished to purchase anything, yet he was unsure of what he needed. Swiftly, she handed him an onion, claiming it was a rare variety that alleviated insomnia, presumably what he required. When it came to his requests, he humorously suggested adding more pepper and onions to his bag. However, the conversation took a turn when she queried about his presence in Balkan, noting his distinctive magic unfamiliar to her. This encounter left our hero uneasy, sensing an extraordinary aura emanating from her. Our hero was puzzled about the girl's identity and how she discerned his magical abilities, yet she simply handed him a bag of onions and accepted his payment. As he departed, he mulled over her ability to perceive his mana structure a feat. He thought impossible without specialized equipment, given that she appeared to possess no more than ordinary sight. This led him to speculate whether she possessed exceptional skills or was a highly gifted magician, both options unsettling to him. The realization that his mana could potentially be exposed to almost anyone filled him with apprehension. Determined to safeguard his magical essence, he resolved to dedicate all his spare time to the study of magic within the confines of his room. Hursting's goal was to enhance the potency of his existing magical abilities. Despite his relentless pursuit of knowledge, our hero could not unlock the secrets of his unique magic, and his predicament deepened. His reliance on potions grew, requiring increasingly potent concoctions. To procure these, he needed a valid ID. He approached Jenny for assistance, yet she seemed perplexed by his expectations. Nonetheless, she indicated that acquiring such a document would come at a steep price. So with earnest hope, he inquired about the cost, to which Jenny stated the service would amount to 20 million herrings. Jenny reassured our hero, revealing she had secured a new opportunity for him. She recognized the potential of utilizing his magic for various tasks. Eager to proceed, our hero listened as Jenny explained the assignment originated from a corporation, suggesting a more lucrative compensation than typical hunter roles. While she acknowledged our hero's penchant for hunting, she advised that corporate contracts could offer substantial financial rewards, likely more appealing than pursuing elusive criminals. Jenny led our hero to a private room to discuss the details of the task. She revealed it involved a new cosmetics factory in District 42, named after Charlotte. The project, she noted, was heavily subsidized by the state, a counter 80% of its funding. Jenny expressed her concerns over the ethical implications as the products were tested on humans immediately after production. She highlighted the factory's capability to produce anti-aging treatments capable of reviving dead cells. Disturbingly, she mentioned allegations of extreme experimentation on individuals emphasizing the manufacturer's focus on profit over ethical considerations. Our hero's interest peaked as he inquired about the additional requirements, given the situation seemed largely unraveled. Jenny explained that despite the controversy, Charlotte's operations remained unaffected due to the involvement of influential figures who disregarded the circulating rumors. 
However, our hero's client, Veritz Corporation, had recently entered the cosmetics industry and sought to displace Charlotte. They proposed two options. The first offered $350 million for the successful acquisition of proprietary cosmetic data through infiltration. Alternatively, should this approach not align with our hero's preferences, a second option entailed the complete demolition of the factory, ensuring its inability to be reconstructed, for which they would compensate $50 million. Our hero pondered the daunting nature of the first task, a sentiment Jenny quickly affirmed. She speculated that perhaps the client was hesitant to offer a higher reward, chuckling at the notion that the task might as well be an indirect plea for the factory's demise. Without hesitation, our hero declared his willingness to undertake the mission, viewing it as straightforward. Jenny, visibly delighted by his determination, promised to introduce him to his new collaborator. Anxiety crept over our hero upon hearing of a partner, a detail previously undisclosed, especially as a mysterious man in a suit approached them. Upon his initial assessment, our hero was under the impression he was about to collaborate with someone less competent, until Jenny introduced the individual as Dylan, a mercenary linked with Aunt Therese, known for his cost-effective services. Dylan queried Jenny on her choice of introduction, concerned it might lead our hero to doubt his capabilities. Nonetheless, our hero stood approached Dylan, and they exchanged a handshake signaling a budding camaraderie. Our hero questioned the necessity of a partnership for the mission, to which Jenny explained the assignment's complexity warranted collaboration. Dylan boasted of his solo capabilities, but Jenny's insistence on teamwork prevailed. His remarks seemed to provoke Jenny's displeasure, as she preferred discussions to remain focused and relevant. Our hero consented to collaborate, albeit with a preference for prior notification of the partnership. He inquired about the division of rewards to which Jenny replied that they would equally distribute the earnings, acknowledging her oversight in this instance. Dylan interjected, surprised by the possibility of such an arrangement, while our hero noted Jenny's swift admission of her mistake. The situation escalated when Dylan playfully tugged at Jenny's mask, suggesting she hadn't erred unintentionally. Our hero speculated that Jenny's actions might have been a deliberate attempt to test him, yet he remained unfazed by this possibility. Our hero had the option to part ways with Jenny at any moment. After Jenny concluded her mock battle with Dylan, she proposed they review the factory's layout. She detailed the plan, noting the superior infrastructure of neighborhoods below the 50th compared to those above, yet acknowledged the commendable facilities throughout the city. The factory in question was situated in the well-appointed 42nd district. While our hero pondered the quietude of the streets, Dylan engaged him with numerous inquiries. Dylan shared his observation that Jenny held a high regard for our hero, a departure from her usual financially motivated stance. Typically, Jenny would secure a commission from such ventures, but in this instance, she chose not to, aiming instead to preserve their camaraderie. Our protagonist discerned that he eavesdropped on their conversation at the tavern. Dylan, however, wore a melancholic expression. Jenny's actions had left him disheartened. Our hero pondered the purpose of Dylan's mask. Perhaps it served to conceal his identity, rendering him unrecognizable. In that moment, Dylan extended a business card, assuring our hero that they need not be confined to the same workplace. Our protagonist accepted the card and inquired if Dylan was placing trust in him. Dylan was forthright explaining that locating skilled magicians had become nearly impossible. His agency harbored a pool of potential collaborators. Yet, as their exchange concluded, Dylan implored our hero to keep their dialogue confidential from Jenny. Our hero grinned, acknowledging the clandestine nature of their interaction. Still, curiosity lingered. How would this enigmatic Deadpool operate in action? Perched on the rooftop, our protagonist surveyed the surroundings. The guards appeared inconsequential, and the structure seemed fragile. However, Dylan asserted that this was by design. Only a madman would attempt to breach Charlotte's. Our hero wouldn't have spared them a second glance if the Veritz Corporation hadn't assigned them a mission. Yet, there was something peculiar about these Sentinels, specifically their Triple Eight affiliation, former thugs, they were distinct from other guards, almost inhuman. Killing them wouldn't weigh on anyone's conscience. As our hero prepared to depart, Dylan posed a question. Was he embarking on this mission with an open mind? To emphasize his point, Dylan produced another mask, which our hero reluctantly accepted. Disappointed by its absurdity and ugliness, our hero resolved to fashion a makeshift mask from his own attire rather than don the unappealing one Dylan offered. Having donned the mask, our hero stood poised for the mission. The plan was straightforward. While Dylan served as a diversion, our protagonist would infiltrate the warehouse, wreak havoc, and obliterate everything in one fell swoop. Though seemingly mundane to some, our hero understood the stakes. When push came to shove, he'd rely on Dylan. Following our hero's directive, Dylan sprang into action with astonishing speed. The guards remained oblivious. Dylan's velocity rendered him nearly invisible. 
he incapacitated two sentinels poised to strike our hero when his attention shifted to a truck bearing a lone figure. Swiftly, he radioed for reinforcements. Dylan stealthily approached the man, startling him. Our hero had studied the photograph. He knew he needn't worry about Dylan and that Jenny's recruits were trustworthy. Armed with the Viper, our hero embarked on a solo mission, confronted by a locked door. He wielded the torch he'd acquired from the bandits. Finally, an opportunity to employ it. As the door swung open, a guard confronted him, demanding he raise his hands. Recognizing the ordinary nature of this sentinel, our hero opted not to take a life. Instead, he rendered the guard unconscious, employing his puppet ability. No need to entangle himself in civilian affairs. He escorted the guard out. Venturing further, our hero encountered a staircase, convinced he was on the right path. With Dylan providing diversion, he anticipated a seamless operation. Yet the reality proved different. As the guards grappled with Dylan, our hero's fatigue mounted there were more sentinels than expected. He entered an empty room, pondering whether they'd all gone in search of his friend. Bam. A closer look revealed rifles trained on him. The gravity of his predicament sank in. He was encircled by guards. Most would falter or plead for mercy, but not Dylan. His situation amused him. He relished the collective attention. The guards bellowed for our hero to prostrate himself. Defiance would invite bullets. Yet Dylan reveled in it. If he could neutralize the guards, fulfill his end of the bargain, he'd succeed, drawing his small dagger. He lunged a tempest of fury, leaving bodies in his wake. Dylan remained elusive. Bullets missed their mark. Having dispatched the guards, our hero craved a new adversary. He treaded through the dungeon, eyes scanning the surroundings. His gaze fell upon a valve, an object he urgently wanted to manipulate. Aware that this facility housed a gas system, he envisioned the stored gas as a potent explosive. With great effort, he loosened the valve, leaving only a spark to ignite the volatile chemistry. Our hero raised his hands, conjuring a flame. Elementary elemental magic sufficed. Creating fire was straightforward. He reflected on the vegetable shop encounter. The girl had unwittingly catalyzed his exploration and enhancement of elemental magic. Grateful, he combined simple spells, birthing a novel in Canton, set for precisely five minutes. It would trigger a cascade of events. As the countdown commenced, our hero and Dylan detected peculiar noises emanating from the gate. In that moment, a lizard confronted Dylan, questioning the chaos he caused. Our hero, too, felt concern for Dylan and stepped into view. Peering from the corner, he discerned an unusual sight at the gate, not merely a lizard, but a crocodile-like creature, an old acquaintance of Dylan's. The crocodile inquired about his well-being, but Dylan assured him that he needn't fret both he and Andres were unscathed. The crocodile, however, harbored doubts about their ability to independently establish and grow a business. Nevertheless, he commended his old acquaintances, acknowledging that their talents hadn't been squandered. Dylan retorted that their success was largely due to his boss's innovative approach. The crocodile chuckled, taunting Dylan about his precarious situation. Dylan's sole concern now, the price tag on the crocodile's contract to eliminate him. But the answer 10 million failed to appease Dylan, he seed. Undeterred, the crocodile prepared to strike. Yet Dylan had a crocodile's, the bag lying at the crocodile's feet. The crocodile, perplexed, complied. When Dylan extracted a spear from the bag, he warned the crocodile that laughter would soon cease. Without hesitation, the crocodile sent Dylan hurtling through the air, pondering the outcome. Reflecting on Dylan's penchant for verbosity, he realized that his adversary had always been a chatterbox. Dylan chalked up his misfortune to bad luck, reaching into his bag for another weapon, determined he charged into battle against the crocodile each attempt ending in failure, followed by another and another. Our hero observed the unfolding scene from the shadows. Uncertainty nodded him Dylan's brute force approach clashed with the impending explosion, a mere two minutes and 17 seconds away. Time ticked relentlessly, and Dylan's relentless combat only exacerbated the urgency. Could our hero escape solo? The crocodile's formidable strength loomed large, surpassing even Dylan's prowess. Now he resolved to seize control to intervene. Standing over the already battered Dylan, the crocodile expressed disappointment. Dylan had changed. His former bloodthirstiness had waned. Yet, he lacked the same ferocity they'd witnessed during their initial encounter. Rising from the floor, Dylan contradicted the crocodile. He asserted that the crocodile had grown stronger year by year. Retrieving two daggers from his belt, Dylan exuded an enigmatic aura. He questioned whether the crocodile sensed his familiar energy. Then, with lightning speed, Dylan lunged at the crocodile. Curiously, the crocodile struggled to match his movements. The villain realized he needed to push even further to become faster still. The crocodile, who had been mocking his feeble attempts, had already ensnared him and was poised to strike. But our mysterious hero stepped in, 
wielding ancient magic to bind the ferocious reptile. Dylan, wide-eyed at the sudden appearance of this enigmatic savior, regained his composure. A crocodile, undeterred by the electric restraints, lunged at Dylan, who retaliated with newfound determination. Ignoring the crackling energy, the crocodile seized Dylan by the throat. It demanded to know why Dylan hadn't mentioned the magician earlier. Such intrigue would have made their encounter far more captivating from the outset. The crocodile, amused by our hero's tricks, held Dylan captive, promising to deal with him before pursuing the elusive magician. With a mighty blow, it struck Dylan's face, propelling him through two solid walls. The battle had only just begun, and secrets lay hidden in the shadows. The crocodile, relentless in its pursuit, had our hero on edge. Its lightning strikes could melt steel, and yet the beast seemed impervious to our hero's magical defenses. Realizing the inevitable outcome, our hero focused on locating Dylan, who lay battered and bruised nearby. Determined to rescue his friend, our hero reluctantly employed a forbidden spell, one he had sworn never to use. Relying on mana for his power, he began to bolster his strength and agility. Our hero was primarily focused on the imminent explosion of the factory behind them. Meanwhile, the crocodile continued its search for our mage hero, but suddenly detected an unusual scent. At this crucial moment, a five-minute timer went off, followed by the factory's explosion. Our hero and Dylan were found on the ground, shielded from the blast, by an energy barrier conjured by our hero. Dylan, feeling as though every bone in his body was shattered, voiced his discomfort. Our hero, realizing he couldn't offer assistance at that moment, sat down and retrieved a whipper. The villain observed this and inquired about his stance on whippers, highlighting their notorious side effects. Despite this, our hero remained indifferent, celebrating their survival against the formidable crocodile. He commended Dylan, suggesting he was nearly as powerful as the beast, used by our hero's words and preferring to avoid further mention of the crocodile. Dylan accepted the praise without further discussion. Without hesitation, Dylan urged our hero to depart swiftly from the scene, to avoid any fatal outcomes. Our hero questioned Dylan about the crocodile's survival, but Dylan, puzzled by our hero's lack of awareness, was certain of the crocodile's resilience. It turned out the crocodile was not only alive but also a figure of significant power and influence. Rising from the debris, the crocodile emerged virtually unscathed and visibly enraged. Dylan shared that the crocodile once served as a military mercenary, before ascending to lead the Pandemonium, a notorious global organization that recruits only the most formidable criminals. This crocodile effortlessly claimed the leadership position. Our hero was astonished to learn of the crocodile's prestigious status within the organization. However, their relief at having survived was quickly overshadowed by the appearance of Croven, the crocodile himself, standing ominously close by. Dylan swiftly initiated their escape, alerting our hero to the urgency. Yet Croven, determined to halt their flight, leaped forward, separating them with formidable force. Our hero recognized that despite the ability to enhance one's physique with mana, some powers defy all logic. The Kraken pondered our hero's youthful appearance and prowess as a mage, questioning the pairing of such a visage with magical capabilities. Realizing escape was futile, our hero turned to Dylan and found him still breathing, a glimmer of hope amidst despair. Aware that engaging Kraken in combat meant a swift resolution was imperative due to the constraints of time. Approached by Kraken, who inquired about the use of electric magic and humorously criticized the rudeness of binding someone. Our hero retorted that such measures are permissible against non-human adversaries, prompting laughter from Kraken. He expressed a begrudging respect, admitting he might have spared our hero if not for the financial losses incurred by the factory's destruction. As Kraken's attack loomed, our hero employed a gravity-binding spell ensnaring Kraken in a dense material that hindered his movement, explaining that the efficacy of this constraint escalates with the target's mass, complicating Kraken's escape. Just intrigued, Kraken expressed a desire to test this limitation further. Kraken initiated his counter, causing the binding material to start tearing. Observing this, our hero intensified his magical efforts. Kraken, puzzled by the tactics and confident in his eventual escape, found himself momentarily speechless due to a spell cast by our hero. Realizing the temporary nature of his advantage, our hero contemplated his next move, aiming to use his dwindling mana reserves judiciously. Meanwhile, Kraken began to extricate himself from the diminishing restraints. He threatened our hero, who, facing mortal danger, prepared to unleash his full potential. Kraken, intrigued by the impending showdown, watched closely, eager to witness the outcome. At this critical juncture, our hero unleashed the Ice Captivity spell, encapsulating Kraken in a block of ice. The exertion left our hero exhausted, inadvertently affecting Dylan, who found himself amidst the frost, chilled yet alive. Approaching Dylan, our hero remarked on the unintended consequences of his actions, suggesting the cold was a result of the attire, rather than the weather, humorously dismissing Dylan's discomfort. 
Dylan, prioritizing their safety, urged immediate departure to avoid Kraken's potential liberation. Simultaneously, the ice encasing Kraken began to fracture. Bill urgently implored our hero for action, anticipating Kraken's imminent escape. Facing a critical depletion of mana, our hero resorted to a simpler form of magic, one that could bolster ranged weaponry, a technique manageable with minimal magical energy. Recalling his adventures in World 2.0, where he excelled as a marksman, our hero decided to employ a blend of offensive magic. He enhanced his firearm and ammunition, bestowing upon them attributes of armor penetration and accelerated velocity. Fully aware of the risk to his weapon's integrity from the mana infusion, convinced that this confrontation could very well be their last stand, our hero, utilizing another skill, took precise aim at Kraken's head and executed the shot. The bullet, propelled with enhanced force, struck Kraken, sending him reeling. Dylan, caught off guard by the unconventional use of a firearm in combat, concurred with the urgent need for retreat, recognizing our hero's dwindling energy reserves and their precarious situation. Despite our hero's strategic efforts, Kraken emerged unscathed, unaffected by the firearm's assault. The only evidence of the encounter was a bullet lodged near Kraken's eye, a testament to our hero's attempt that only managed to slightly mirror the beast. Our hero grimly acknowledged the futility of his actions, realizing the bullet's impact was minimal against Kraken's formidable defenses. This encounter merely prompted a disdainful reaction from our hero towards the resilient adversary. Kraken, amused by our hero's candid admission, yet indifferent to his own humanity brushed off the minor inconvenience of the bullet. Our hero's arsenal was depleted, his mana reserves exhausted. With no magical energy left to harness, our hero's last resort was a laser cutter, a tool far removed from his magical repertoire. Kraken's anger intensified, baffled by their persistence despite offering them a swift end. As Kraken launched himself skyward, our hero faced what seemed to be his final moments. However, as Kraken descended, the anticipated demise did not occur. Instead, a girl with a monogreen hue intervened, standing protectively over our hero. This unexpected turn of events left our hero contemplating his fate under the new mysterious savior's shadow. Our hero, puzzled by the identity of the woman who intervened, watched as Kraken's frustration grew. The battle's continuation seemed futile to him, recognizing it as a squander of his time. Addressing the newcomer, Kraken inquired if she was Evelyn, associated with the city's governance. Evelyn responded, admonishing Kraken for overstepping boundaries, particularly for the factory's destruction, an act she attributed to him. Kraken, confused, denied responsibility, instead pointing the blame towards our heroes. Evelyn, however, dismissed Kraken's defense, skeptical of the notion that individuals behind masks were the culprits of the explosion. Kraken was displeased with Evelyn's quick assumption, finding it unjust that the blame was so readily placed on him rather than considering the possibility of our hero's involvement. This exchange highlighted the complexities of blame and identity in their conflict, with Evelyn standing firm in her accusations against Kraken, embodying the city's stance against chaos. Kraken resigned to his stance, told Evelyn she could hold whatever opinion she preferred, but he had no interest in engaging further, especially against a government representative. Battling without compensation fell outside his contractual obligations, prompting his desire to disengage from the confrontation. Our hero regaining his footing, Observed the interaction with intrigue, recognizing the considerable influence and strength Evelyn possessed to deter Kraken's advances. Without facing them, Evelyn inquired about the well-being of our heroes. Dylan's admiration for her bravery was palpable, though she modestly attributed her actions to her duty. Upon removing her mask, our hero recognized Evelyn as the vendor who sold him vegetables, revealing an unexpected connection between them. Despite her offer of assistance, our hero chose to stand on his own. Evelyn's curiosity was piqued by our hero's familiar visages, though he opted to keep the truth of their acquaintance to himself, pondering over the complexity of her identity beyond a simple vendor and her ties to the government. As she prepared to leave, Evelyn concluded that she might have been mistaken in recognizing our hero due to a distinct difference in his mana pattern from someone she had presumed him to be, illustrating the layers of mystery and misconception entwining their interactions. Our hero reflected on the unique nature of his mana pattern, acknowledging its variability with each use of magic, which might render Evelyn's advice less pertinent at their future encounters. As Evelyn departed, donning her mask once again, she left them with a cautionary note against any dealings with pandemonium for those who wish to preserve their lives, before ascending skyward. Dylan remarked on their fortunate escape, to which our hero responded with a contemplation of the financial repercussions of the day's events. He attributed the necessity of forfeiting a portion of his fee to his own decisions, including the organization of a fight club and delaying their departure from the factory, which precipitated the ensuing chaos. 
He acknowledged his pivotal role in buying them time during the conflict, where Dylan credited their survival to Luck, Dylan, untroubled by the financial outcome and grateful for our hero's intervention, proposed a division of the reward where he would accept 10 million, allowing our hero the remainder of 40 million. Despite potentially receiving a significant share, our hero sensed a lingering dissatisfaction, feeling the weight of the day's events and decisions. After concluding their mission, our hero indulged in another viper, drawing concern from Dylan who commented on its detrimental effects. Dylan suggested adopting a fitness regimen similar to his own, but our hero dismissed the advice, emphasizing the irreler heroes of physical strength in this context and asserting his autonomy. Returning home, our hero struggled to reach his bed, subsequently falling into a deep slumber for four days, a period of rest prompted by either the depletion of mana or the excessive use of viper. This realization sparked a desire for change, recognizing the need for willpower, patience, and healthier lifestyle choices, including superior medication and nutrition. Determined to address his financial needs, our hero visited Jenny to collect his earnings, greeted warmly upon arrival. Jenny's inquiry into his absence was met with a nonchalant, albeit deceptive, explanation of personal engagements. She humorously suggested that had our hero met an unfortunate fate, the reward would have been hers alone, a jest to which our hero responded with a reminder of his presence and claim to the reward. Amidst discussions of survival and recovery, our hero learned of Dylan's intention to share a portion of his earnings, facilitated by Jenny who had deducted a fee for the transaction. The narrative took a turn with the revelation that their employer had awarded our hero a significant bonus, leaving him in awe at the sight of the monetary reward laid before him, a tangible affirmation of their valor and the challenges overcome. Jenny elucidated the peculiar appearance of the banknotes, explaining they were crafted for the elite, yet remained valid for transactions. She commended our heroes on their commendable performance, especially highlighting their confrontation with Kraken. Our hero modestly noted the peril they faced, crediting their survival to the intervention of a hero. Inquiring about Evelyn, Jenny shared that she knew of her as a government representative, part of a special armed unit with substantial backing. Turning the discussion towards pandemonium, Jenny described it as one of the most elite criminal factions, dubbed the Crime Kings, known for their rigorous selection process and the secrecy surrounding their operations. She knew of Kraken's affiliation with this group, advising our hero to liken any encounter with him to a catastrophic event, emphasizing the dire outcomes typically associated with such meetings. While our hero pondered these revelations, Jenny presented him with a piece of paper for acquiring an identification card, urging immediate action and expressing astonishment at our hero's lack of a bank account. Her exasperation underscored the necessity of formalizing one's financial affairs, particularly after receiving a substantial reward. Understanding the complexities of managing the substantial cash rewards he receives, our hero expressed his gratitude to Jenny for her guidance. Subsequently, he, adopting a new guise, entered a nondescript room where a bald individual was stationed at a computer. Upon mentioning Jenny's referral, the man's reaction affirmed that he had been expecting our hero, alluding to a prior discussion with Jenny about the task at hand. Eager to proceed, the bald man prioritized the financial transaction, prompting our hero to hand over 20 million from his earnings. The bald man's fascination with the high-value banknotes was evident, as he remarked on their rarity in previous circulation among only the most influential figures, a status not commonly extended to commercial banks. This observation led him to surmise the significance of our hero's patronage to Jenny, suggesting that she had facilitated this meeting to cater specifically to our hero's unique needs, highlighting the importance of the connection between Jenny and our hero within their professional network. The bald technician informed our hero of the necessity to navigate through the Balkan registration network, sparking curiosity about the nature of these modifications. Our hero inquired whether this involved altering information within the network. Clarifying, the technician explained his method didn't entail altering actual data but rather adjusting superficial details such as age, photo, and address to craft a new identity. This process, though effective in creating an ED, was noted for its vulnerability. A thorough investigation could easily unravel the constructed identity. The technician mentioned a more secure, albeit costly, alternative involving a direct bribe to the network administrator, guaranteeing a seamless integration into the system for a fee of $400 million. This hefty sum disheartened our hero, highlighting the financial implications of securing a foolproof identity. Proceeding with the initial, less costly method, the technician completed his task within the network and prompted our hero for the desired name to be associated with the new identity. Moving forward with the creation process amidst the complexities and ethical considerations of such digital manipulations, our hero decided on Evan as his new first name, entrusting the bald technician with the selection of a suitable surname reflecting his understanding of the necessity for a credible identity within society.
Dare of the potential need to abandon this new alias, he adapted his appearance accordingly, preparing for various scenarios to navigate his professional endeavors successfully. Upon completion of the technician's work, our hero, now walking down the street, held the tangible evidence of his existence within the societal fabric for the first time, despite the knowledge that the details of his face, address, and age were fabrications. He acknowledged the necessity of these measures for survival. In a world that demanded conformity and identification, he grappled with the paradox of his situation. The falsehoods that enabled him to exist freely were the same ones that obscured his true self. Yet in this moment, he allowed himself to embrace the semblance of authenticity, recognizing that survival often necessitates compromise and adaptation. Today, despite the underlying deceptions, he could experience a sense of belonging and legitimacy in the societal construct. Our hero reached out to Jenny, informing her of his acquisition of a personal phone to facilitate direct communication. Jenny, somewhat surprised by this update, reminded him of her prior directive to maintain contact strictly for professional reasons. She humorously noted that our hero seemed to be the first person in the city to purchase a phone in a considerable span, likening him to a solitary magician devoted to intensive training. However, she pragmatically advised our hero on the necessity of establishing a legitimate daytime source of income to sustain his covert operations without raising suspicion, highlighting the peculiarity of a seemingly unemployed individual amassing wealth. She suggested the pragmatic step of securing employment. Our hero pondered over Jenny's counsel, uncertain about his future engagements with her and the broader implications of his clandestine work. Yet he recognized the wisdom in obtaining a conventional job as a facade for his activities. Jenny, with a light-hearted demeanor, mentioned that our hero's reputation, particularly after the recent mission, was likely to spread rapidly, possibly influencing his professional prospects. Although uncertain of the specific opportunities that might arise, she hinted at the potential for increased compensation aligned with the scale and complexity of future assignments, subtly encouraging our hero to consider the long-term benefits of continuing their collaboration. After ending the call, our hero reflected on his interaction with Jenny, deciding to maintain a cautious distance despite any potential softening in her demeanor. He suspected that Jenny had been informed by Dylan of his ability to wield ice magic, yet chose not to discuss it openly. Understanding their conversations were strategically focused on mutual interest. Our hero remained guarded about revealing too much. The narrative then shifts back to a prior request our hero made to Jenny regarding vipers. When he inquired about acquiring one, Jenny questioned his preference for what she deemed an inferior product, citing the adverse side effects associated with its use. Confused by her initial response, our hero listened as Jenny proposed an alternative, mentioning she knew of a reputable source residing in the 30s district. She contrasted the environment of the 30s with the 40s, highlighting the expansive parks, ports, and recreational areas that characterized the 31st district, subtly advising our hero to explore this option for a potentially safer and more reliable source of vipers. Our hero was taken aback by Jenny's straightforward response to his query about vipers, noting the absence of any probing questions or an offer to delve deeper into the subject. He pondered whether her reticence stemmed from caution or a desire to guard her own secrets. Recognizing the impossibility of gleaning insights without revealing his own secrets, our hero resolved not to remain passive. Arriving at his designated location by car, our hero found himself contemplating the vendor Jenny mentioned, who was known to sell vipers in the botanical garden. Heeding Jenny's advice, he decided to adopt the alias van and alter his appearance for this encounter. As our hero entered the garden, he marveled at its lush, jungle-like ambiance, replete with an array of exotic plants. He questioned the existence of such a verdant oasis within the Balkans, intrigued by the possibility that this was indeed the place Jenny had described. Navigating through the garden, our hero discovered a door leading to what appeared to be a store, and subsequently, a second door that opened to a basement emitting a peculiar aroma. This scent, reminiscent of his viper yet distinctly different, piqued his curiosity as he ventured further into the unknown. Upon entering the room, our hero was enveloped by a thick haze and an unfamiliar aroma. The vendor, an elderly man with a peculiar green crystal embedded in his eye, initially questioned our hero's identity. Our hero, using the alias provided by Jenny, mentioned his connection to her, which seemed to momentarily confuse the vendor. However, reconciling his role as a merchant, the man acknowledged the importance of welcoming new clientele, recognizing the primary objective of any business transaction, the exchange of goods for payment. Curiosity peaked, the vendor scrutinized our hero, inquiring about his purpose in the garden. Rather than diving straight into his quest for vipers, our hero expressed interest in the garden's coexistence within a real botanical setting. Highlighting a plant, the vendor introduced it as Ionium, boasting of its properties to enhance energy, physical attributes, and endurance, 
attributes echoed by the myriad of similar flora surrounding them. With a wide, enigmatic smile, the vendor posed a rhetorical question to our hero, pondering why he shouldn't operate his unique trade within the botanical garden's lush confines. This encounter not only illuminated the garden's exotic offerings, but also hinted at the old man's unconventional approach to commerce, nestled within an environment teeming with natural enhancements. Engaged in the conversation, our hero seized the opportunity to request assistance from the vendor, presenting his whipper, a tool he had used to aid in mana restoration. The old man, after a thorough examination and even a taste test, expressed his disdain for the product, questioning its efficacy and suggesting it was more detrimental than beneficial. Our hero explained its role in mana recovery, prompting the vendor to scrutinize him more closely and comment on our hero's unassuming appearance for a warrior barbarian. Clarifying his identity as a mage, our hero received insight from the old man that Viper, particularly a variant of higher quality, could potentially enhance a mage's abilities, contrary to the low-grade substance our hero had been utilizing. The vendor relayed rumors of a specific Viper that could significantly amplify a mage's powers, though he remained skeptical about the veracity of such claims and hesitant to vouch for them personally. The conversation revealed the old man's curiosity about the nature of magic, questioning whether its mastery demanded rigorous effort or something more elusive. This exchange opened a window into the complex interplay between magical proficiency, the physical constitution of the practitioner, and the external enhancers like Viper, shedding light on the nuanced considerations a mage like our hero must navigate in his quest for power and resilience. Our hero, recognizing the potential for a more sophisticated alternative to the inferior Whipper, expressed his interest in procuring an enhancer with greater efficacy and minimal adverse effects. The old man, dismissive of the low-quality Whipper as barely beneficial and harmful to one's physique, encouraged the pursuit of a superior option. Upon revealing his financial capacity with $2 million bills, the vendor's enthusiasm was evident, prompting him to search for a more suitable product. Meanwhile, at the bar, Jenny grappled with disbelief over Dylan's descriptions of our hero's capabilities. Not only did she ponder the rarity of our hero's decision to save Dylan a contrast to the typical self-preservation seen in magicians, but she also mulled over the implications of our hero's versatility in magic, particularly his use of both ice and electricity. This versatility, a rare trait among magicians, is Jenny convinced of Dylan's ability to discern the distinct elements, signaling our hero's exceptional mastery and raising questions about the breadth and depth of his powers. Jenny found herself contemplating our hero's undisclosed versatility in magic, particularly his capability with the element of lightning, puzzled by his decision to keep such a skill hidden. The old man seizing an opportunity for jest, playfully inquired if her curiosity stemmed from jealousy of our hero's adeptness. Jenny, however, reflected on the broader implications of possessing such rapidly adaptable skills and the uniqueness of such a trait. Attempting to steer the conversation towards pragmatic considerations, the old man suggested that the most tangible offer they could extend to our hero was the opportunity for gainful employment. Aligning with this perspective, Jenny considered whether introducing our hero to job opportunities from reputable companies would be advantageous. However, the old man raised a valid concern regarding our hero's willingness to undertake new assignments, especially in light of the recent disastrous event at the factory. This prompted Jenny to deliberate on the potential challenges and prospects of facilitating our hero's employment, acknowledging the complexities introduced by his extraordinary abilities and the recent tumultuous incidents. Jenny speculated on the likelihood of our hero encountering Kraken in the future. Considering his escalating involvement in their world, the old man suggested tasks involving criminals, yet Jenny leaned towards integrating our hero with mercenaries, deeming them less conspicuous and more amenable to communication. She believed their office would greatly benefit from enlisting a magician of our hero's caliber, viewing it as a substantial asset. The old man observing Jenny's enthusiasm revealed his assistance to her business was at Kate's behest, though he expressed doubts about his ability to ensure her safety. Acknowledging Jenny's strengths and independence, he also pointed out her impatience as a significant vulnerability. Jenny, not appreciating the critique, silenced him with a gesture, leading the slighted old man to depart. The scene shifts back to our hero and the vendor, who presented a novel variant of Viper. This upgraded version promised not only a six-hour enhancement of physical capabilities, but also a boost in magical power and endurance, marking a significant improvement over the products our hero had previously utilized. This development opened new avenues for our hero's capabilities, suggesting an evolution in his approach to harnessing his magical and physical potentials. The vendor presented our hero with an enhanced version of Viper, promising a boost in bodily and magical performance for six hours. Despite a list of daunting side effects, including headaches, cramps, vomiting, and potentially coughing up blood, these adverse reactions, he claimed, 
would be less severe than those associated with previous iterations of the product. Considering the price, this was purported to be the best available option for our hero. While our hero evaluated the product, the vendor mentioned that the side effects could be mitigated, albeit for a higher price and only sold in minimum quantities of 10. Upon hearing our hero's comparison of his product to those of Calvin and Cubs, the vendor expressed disdain, emphasizing the inferior quality of their goods due to excessive chemical usage. Our hero acknowledging the information with a smile, realized it was time to depart. He bid farewell to the vendor, who reciprocated the gesture. The scene then shifts to a disgruntled figure reviewing a resignation request on his desk, lamenting the anticipated long-term confrontations with higher or dual element mages. This individual is revealed as Dry Crimber, the head of the Crimber Guild, facing internal critiques regarding his leadership and interpersonal approach with guild members. Wayne, a mercenary within the ranks, attempted humor with Captain Dry Crimber, but the jest fell flat, provoking a thunderous reaction from the captain who slammed the table in frustration. He vociferously clarified that the tasks assigned to his mages were straightforward, to clear a single block. Kettle chimed in, suggesting that the perceived difficulty of their assignments was exaggerated for the eye-fragile and frail nerds that were their mages, a comment that sparked further debate among the mercenaries about the feasibility of altering their approach. Amidst this turmoil, Captain Crimber lamented the necessity of recruiting two additional mages for their pending mission, uncertain of where to find such resources. In a twist of fate, Jenny called, inquiring if the captain needed a mage. His immediate emphatic response underscored the dire need for not just one, but preferably two mages. Jenny, however, could only promise one, assuring him that the quality of this single mage would surpass that of any others he had previously encountered. As our hero observed his new associates, Jenny confidently proclaimed over the phone that our hero's capabilities would render him incomparable to any mage Captain Crimber had previously engaged with, setting the stage for an intriguing collaboration. Our hero was deep in meditation within the tranquility of his room, harnessing his focus for magical training. His objective was mastering the barrier technique, traditionally requiring the drawing of a magical circle and performing an elaborate ritual. However, our hero sought a more direct approach, tapping into the fabric of space itself through concentrated awareness. He envisioned crafting a magical sphere in the void, its surface imbued with protective enchantments. Within this conceptualized barrier, he designed a mechanism where any intruder breaching its perimeter would trigger 14 lightning strikes an effect further intensified by the incorporation of gravitational magic. Pleased with his creative endeavors, our hero appreciated the liberty afforded by having his own house away from the constraints of hotel living, allowing him to fully engage in his magical preparations. As he poised to initiate the second phase of his training, a call from Jenny interrupted, bringing with it the proposition of a new job opportunity. This timely offer hinted at the balance our hero sought between honing his magical skills and navigating the demands of his burgeoning career under Jenny's guidance. Our hero, now equipped with a cell phone, immediately accepted Jenny's job offer, recognizing the indispensable role his new device played in this swift communication. The cell phone also allowed him to stay updated with local news where the incident at the Charlotte factory in the 42nd district was prominently featured. The reports indicated potential disruptions in the area's new production processes, necessitating the evacuation of residents within a two-kilometer radius. While the explosion had not damaged any surrounding structures, it was attributed to a gas leak sparing the factory from scrutiny. Our hero contemplated the news, suspecting Charlotte's company might be framing the incident as an accident to mitigate corporate liability. Despite the substantial payment he received for his involvement, he couldn't help but reflect on his own successful navigation through the ordeal. The thought of ignoring potential repercussions appealed to him, yet he acknowledged the presence of factors beyond his control, stirring a sense of unease. This realization underscored the need for caution in future dealings with corporations, hinting at the complex web of responsibilities and consequences inherent in his line of work. Our hero, having encountered the formidable organization Pandemonium during his two months of work, acknowledged the enormity of the challenge that entities like Kraken represented. Despite Rannick's significant magical aptitude, our hero felt unprepared to confront such formidable foes directly. He recognized that enhancing his magic skills was crucial for increasing his survival odds in any potential conflict. Contemplating the parcel on his bed, our hero decided it was time to advance to the next phase of his training. Unwrapping the package revealed a gun, in addition to his arsenal he was eager to utilize in his ongoing development. Meeting Jenny at the bar, our hero was briefed on the specifics of his new assignment. A guild was attempting to seize control of a building, necessitating the expertise of a fire support mage. Jenny, casually snacking, assured our hero of the lucrative nature of mage services, emphasizing the substantial compensation involved. 
Our hero realized his collaboration would be with mercenaries, though he had not anticipated their affiliation extending beyond the Antares group, indicating a new dynamic and potential alliances in his evolving career. Our hero, seeking specifics about his new assignment, prompted Jenny to share the details. She narrated the predicament of a consultancy firm ousted from their office by a group known as the Janitors, who had since occupied the building unlawfully. The firm was expelled so abruptly they couldn't secure their network, leading to fears of crucial transaction data being compromised. In response, the firm sought assistance from the Krimber Guild, which then enlisted our hero's expertise. Our hero queried whether the mercenaries, commissioned by the financial consultancy, indeed intended to employ him. Jenny confirmed this, explaining that our hero's role as a fire support mage would involve launching attacks from a strategic rear position, emphasizing the task's simplicity for a mage of his caliber. She hinted at other potential missions, but was sidetracked by the burgeoning reputation of the mage who survived a confrontation with Kraken, a tale rapidly gaining traction within their circles. Regaining her focus, Jenny continued to advise our hero that taking on the mission for Kramer would be wise because they operate on a strict monetary basis, ensuring a lower risk of betrayal to their affiliates. When our hero inquired about the frequency of deceit for financial gain, Jenny candidly remarked on the prevalence of unscrupulous individuals within their city, cautioning that some may resort to extreme measures over unsatisfactory work. This revelation momentarily concerned our hero, but Jenny's lighthearted remark about her earnings being commissioned based from such assignments eased the tension, highlighting her pragmatic view of their perilous environment. Our hero, now intrigued, sought clarification on his deployment location. Yep. Jenny specified Area 53 as the rendezvous point, with a scheduled meeting at 5 in the morning promising to send the exact coordinates to his phone. The following morning, the scene shifts to the Krimber crew, a collective of mercenaries and strategists, assembled in anticipation, vigilantly observing the time as they prepare for the operation's commencement. One of the Krimber crew inquired about Captain Krimber's expectations for the new mage joining their ranks. Krimber confidently responded, highlighting the mage's specialization in lightning magic and affirming his value, vouched by Jenny, at 20 million seals. Despite not having personally met our hero, Krimber's trust in Jenny's judgment laid a solid foundation for his expectations. As our hero approached the group, his appearance sparked curiosity among the mercenaries, who found it hard to reconcile his mundane appearance with that of a mage reputed to wield formidable lightning magic. Our hero's casual demeanor, particularly his choice to eat a sandwich before the mission, further puzzled the crew though for him. It was a practical decision to sustain his physical well-being. Interruptions were quickly quelled by Krimber, who emphasized the substantial investment made in our hero's skills, expressing hope that their expectations would be met. Our hero, understanding the underlying concerns, assured them of his commitment to utilizing his abilities to their fullest extent. With our hero's arrival, Captain Krimber proceeded to reaffirm the mission strategy, detailing the objective to secure and normalize operations at the power plant server located on the third floor. Folding his notebook, he shared the architectural layout of the building, setting the stage for the intricate operation ahead, with our hero now integral to their plans. The mission layout was methodically detailed by the captain, delineating two primary ingress routes to their objective. The elevator and the stairs, each guarded by three groups of cleaners adept in mana usage. The caution to maintain vigilance was clear, emphasizing the unexpected prowess of their foes despite initial assessments of weakness. The operational strategy was segmented among three squads. The first was tasked with breaching the second floor via windows to funnel the janitors downwards. The second, led by Wayne, was assigned rooftop entry to neutralize threats and verify server functionality. And the third, accompanied by the captain and our hero, focused on securing the first floor. Post-clearance, Squad 2 would descend to rendezvous with the remaining teams. Our hero, absorbing the plan, recognized the simplicity of the task at hand, attributing the seamless strategy to Krimger's natural leadership. His instructions for our hero were succinct, to leverage his magical prowess from the onset and subsequently provide support to the third squad from the shadows. This directive promptly mobilized the mercenaries who armed themselves in preparation. Our hero reflected on the dynamic interplay between conventional warfare and magical intervention. In a realm where magic augments physical capabilities, the integration of both close and ranged combat weaponry seemed logical. Yet the unique contributions of a mage within such contexts were undeniable, underscoring the indispensable role mages play in the complexity of their missions. Amidst the standoff, the captain speculated on the possibility of their VR adversaries employing their own mage, advising our hero to stay alert for any signs of magical activity. Our hero's attention was soon drawn to an unusual thread lying at his feet, extending into the distance. Intuitively sensing its magical origin, he deduced it was a reconnaissance spell likely meant to gauge their numbers. Seizing the opportunity, 
our hero manipulated the thread, leveraging its dual-purpose nature to trace back to its source, thereby revealing the positions of the opposing scavengers. This maneuver startled the enemy mage, unprepared for such a counteraction. Our hero's strategic intervention led to the unexpected accumulation of mana at the spell's point of origin, overwhelming the enemy mage with a lethal surge of energy. The sudden manifestation of physical distress in the adversary mage, evident through a severe hemorrhagic reaction, left both friend and foe in a state of shock at the unforeseen turn of events. This encounter highlighted the precarious balance of power, where knowledge and control of one's magical abilities could decisively tip the scales in such covert confrontations. Upon neutralizing the enemy mage's detection spell, our hero promptly informed the captain of his success and recommended seizing the moment to initiate their attack. Peering out at the janitors, the captain, initially skeptical, was astonished to find our hero's claim substantiated by the unfolding scenario. He immediately ordered adherence to the initial strategy, prompting the mercenaries to deploy smoke bombs and advance into action. The janitors, caught off guard and on the brink of retaliating, were unprepared for the ensuing chaos. Amidst the confrontation, our hero decided to test the newly acquired whipper. With a forceful pull, his hands became enveloped in lightning, a visual cue to the immense power at his disposal. He recalled the captain's emphasis on providing substantial fire support from the onset. Unleashing his first spell, Chain Lightning, our hero struck down the adversaries with formidable efficiency. The display of his power left both allies and enemies in awe, reinforcing his invaluable role in the conflict. Rallying from the initial shock of our hero's intervention, the captain and his team resumed their offensive, now bolstered by the mage's demonstrated prowess. With their adversaries momentarily bested, the captain rallied his mercenaries, declaring their defensive line breached and signaling the moment to press forward. The captain's team, comprised of formidable warriors adept in both melee combat and marksmanship, confidently diminished their foes. Amidst the melee, they were alerted to incoming reinforcements challenging their advance. Responding swiftly, the squad's shield bearers positioned themselves protectively before the captain, readying a tactical maneuver to counter the assault. On the captain's command, the shield bearers launched a surprise offensive directly at the enemy, an unexpected move that caught their adversaries off guard, followed by further aggressive advances. It was during this chaos that the captain identified an unusual figure among the approaching forces, discerning him to be a mage due to his abrupt disappearance from sight. Meanwhile, an assassin had stealthily approached our hero, inquiring mockingly about his identity as a lightning mage before launching an attack. Unbeknownst to the assassin, our hero's mastery over lightning would prove a formidable defense against the imminent threat showcasing his prowess and the critical role of magic in their strategy. The captain, braced for the worst, was relieved to see our hero neutralize the threat with a precise shot from his gun. Our hero's satisfaction stemmed not from the defeat of his opponent, but from the weapon's capability to endure three spells, a testament to its quality and resilience. Upon assessing our hero's condition and finding him unscathed, the captain concerned quickly turned to admiration for our hero's exceptional marksmanship, speed, and agility, traits not immediately apparent in their initial engagement. This incident sparked a newfound respect and curiosity among the team regarding our hero's versatile skill set. Traditionally, magicians were not known for their proficiency with firearms, making our hero's adept control a topic of intrigue. The captain, witnessing our hero's display of prowess, began to reckon the mage's value far exceeded the initial 20 million. With the immediate threat neutralized and the path ahead declared clear by one of the shield bearers, the captain rallied the team to continue their mission. Our hero's demonstration of skill not only solidified his importance within the team, but also highlighted the synergy between magical abilities and conventional warfare tactics, setting a precedent for future operations. As the operation progressed, each squad deployed to their assigned locations. The first squad initiated their assault with remarkable success, swiftly followed by the second. Leading the third squad, the captain, alongside our hero, navigated the first floor with ruthless efficiency eliminating any adversaries that had managed to survive the initial onslaught. With the first floor secured, the captain inquired about the status of the third floor, but communication with Kitty was momentarily hindered due to operational discretion. An unexpected explosion momentarily unsettled the team, casting a shadow of uncertainty over the mission's continuation. However, tension was quickly dispelled when Kitty emerged, reporting the second floor had been cleared. The delay was attributed to the challenge of flushing out a particularly elusive cleaner necessitating concerted effort for successful neutralization. Prompted by this update, the captain decided to reevaluate the situation with the third squad, ready to consolidate their efforts and address any remaining challenges in securing the objective. This decisive action underscored the dynamic and adaptable leadership required in the face of unforeseen complications during high-stakes operations. As our hero and the captain advanced, 
the significance of Jenny's earlier advice began to crystallize for the captain. Amid strategic considerations, Kitty broached the subject of potentially recruiting our hero to their ranks. A suggestion met with Kremgar's pragmatic acknowledgement of the guild's financial limitations. He advocated for investing in burgeoning talents, over allocating substantial resources to a single individual, despite our hero's exceptional contributions equating to the work of several operatives. Kitty's daydreams of fame and prosperity through our hero's affiliation were swiftly curtailed as the mission's urgency beckoned their focus back to the task at hand. Upon checking in with the third squad, a distressing response hastened their pace towards the squad's location, with our hero lagging slightly behind due to exhaustion. Arriving at the rooftop, they were confronted with a harrowing scene. Mercenaries sprawled and bloodied. Amidst the chaos, Wayne, gravely injured, became the focus of the captain's immediate concern. Without hesitation, the captain administered a highly valuable elixir to Wayne, disregarding its cost in favor of saving a comrade. Wayne's expression of regret was met with a tactical reassessment by our hero, who noted that despite the apparent severity, there had been no fatalities among their ranks, suggesting a possibility of recovery and continued resilience in the face of adversity. This moment underscored the team's solidarity and the inherent risks of their profession, highlighting the balance between strategic loss and the invaluable human element within their operations. Our hero quickly deduced that the assailant responsible for their wounds was likely still among them, given the severity of the injuries inflicted on such seasoned fighters. The captain took charge, prioritizing Wayne's care while preparing to confront the adversary directly. His inquiry into the whereabouts of their assailant was met with a response from a figure in one of the towers, indicating a calculated ambush. The captain, gun aimed at the mysterious individual, demanded accountability for the observation of his team's suffering. The stranger, however, diverted the conversation towards the financial motivations behind their actions, revealing a grand scheme to usurp the server housing district 53's tax information. He outlined the extensive resources pooled by the janitor factions to compromise the server and manipulate the tax data for financial gain. Kramir grappled with the concept of pilfering state funds, a notion far removed from his understanding of theft. The stranger elaborated on exploiting vulnerabilities in the region's power plant to access protected government databases, framing the operation as a lucrative business venture rather than an act of conventional theft. Caught in a moral quandary, Kramir reflected on his military background and the ethical implication of being drawn to such a scheme. The stranger's justification, framing the operation as purely business, did little to sway Kramir's stance. Despite the stranger's attempt to rationalize the operation as a departure from violence and a straightforward commercial enterprise, Kramir remained unconvinced, holding fast to his principles against engaging in actions that contravene his values, regardless of the purported business rationale. In a tense confrontation, the adversary revealed what appeared to be an explosive device, declaring his intent not to be thwarted by mere mercenaries. At Primreg's command, his team unleashed a barrage of gunfire, yet the assailant's sudden transformation into a monstrous entity rendered their efforts futile. Evading bullets with supernatural agility, he launched a brutal attack. This monstrous foe, brandishing a victim in his grasp, posed a chilling question about his preference for the order of his kills, hinting at his reliance on the life energy of others to fuel his powers. Our hero recognized similarities to classes from World 2.0 that harnessed similar energies, speculating the existence of a vampire class consuming human blood to amplify its strength. The notion that such magic could exist in their current reality, with potentially grave side effects yet significant power, was both intriguing and alarming. The vampire's declaration of insufficiency, after a single kill indicated his hunger for more victims, underscoring the dire threat he posed. In a tragic turn, an attempt to protect a teammate with a shield ended in both the shield's destruction and the fatal wounding of the defender. This act of violence highlighted the vampire's formidable might and the perilous situation the team faced, challenging their resolve and demanding an immediate and effective response to neutralize the threat. The captain's order to engage was met with the vampire's relentless onslaught as he savagely attacked, inflicting grave injuries on his adversaries with a knife. In a desperate attempt to protect his team, the captain managed a defense that sent him reeling, Kitty, seizing a moment of opportunity, managed to land a bullet in the vampire's forehead, urging her comrades to follow suit. However, the vampire, confident in his invincibility, dismissed the threat and advanced towards Kitty. In this critical moment, our hero strategically employed his lightning magic, carefully calibrating the attack's intensity and range to avoid collateral damage to both his team and their mission-critical server. Anticipating the vampire's agility, our hero readied himself as the next focus of the vampire's aggression. As predicted, the vampire lunged at our hero, who, despite his physical vulnerability, remained undeterred, understanding the stakes of failure. Facing the vampire's approach with resolve, 
Our hero drew his revolver, aiming and firing at the vampire's chest. Although the shot did not fully incapacitate the foe, it necessitated a decisive follow-up. Our hero, acutely aware of his body's limitations, knew precision was paramount. In a world where magical and martial prowess intertwined, our hero's actions underscored the critical balance required to confront such formidable threats, emphasizing the importance of skill, strategy, and determination in the face of overwhelming odds. Our protagonist discovered his fearlessness in close combat following recent skirmishes. He boldly confronted the vampire, seizing it by the throat and unleashing a torrent of electric shocks. Initially, the vampire howled in agony, yet unexpectedly seized our hero, and phased. Our hero intensified the electrical assault. Surprisingly, the vampire resisted demise, a feat that would ordinarily be fatal, prompting our hero to reassess the resilience of adversaries in this realm. Speculating on the existence of entities capable of enduring such attacks, he resorted to his firearm aiming directly at the vampire's eye. The shot enraged the vampire, who was then subdued by fellow mercenaries. The group pondered the vampire's vulnerability, with their leader contemplating the enigma due to his arcane expertise. The decision was made to consult a magician for insight into the vampire's unusual fortitude. Our hero posited the use of dark magic by the vampire, acknowledging the challenges ahead and the necessity for significant power augmentation to prevail. The vampire derives its energy from consuming human flesh or blood, becoming unstable and irrational when deprived. Our protagonist realized the precarious mental state of his adversary, recognizing a potential decline in communication and defensive capabilities leading to his decision to spare certain lives. He recalled the inherent drawbacks of black magic, noting its limited adoption among wizards due to these disadvantages. Despite its potency, knowledge of black magic remains scarce, with even fewer having encountered its effects firsthand. This obscurity extends to his own forces who are largely unfamiliar with such dark arts. In a decisive moment, our hero instructed his unit to halt, realizing that the aftermath of the confrontation would reveal the vampire's vulnerability. Deep upon the battle's conclusion, the truth dawned on him. Approaching the vampire, he extended his hand, endeavoring to extract all mana and dark magic from his foe. The vampire's screams filled the air as his visage contorted in agony, ultimately collapsing drained of strength. In his grasp, our hero held a mass of dark magic, commanding his team to annihilate the vampire. Although his squad was perplexed by his directive, he assured them of their impending victory. Standing on the brink, our hero pondered the fate of the dark magic orb swirling in his palm. Aware that controlling mana indefinitely was unfeasible without specialized containers, which he lacked and could not create, he contemplated the potential of harnessing and exploring the depths of dark magic. However, the idea of retaining the vampire's mana proved too burdensome and futile. Thus, he released it into the ether. At this juncture, Wayne approached, inquiring whether our hero was a prodigy or something beyond. Confused, our hero received enlightenment from Wayne, who observed his adept mana manipulation, witnessing such skill for the first time. Wayne acknowledged his own inadequacies in magic, marking a moment of profound realization and humility. Our protagonist pondered how an individual like Wayne could discern his unique approach to mana manipulation. He came to realize that Wayne must possess a natural aptitude for mana, suggesting that perhaps his true talent lay not in combat but in his mastery over mana. As Wayne prepared to depart, he expressed admiration for our hero's prowess, questioning whether emulating him could lead to similar mastery. When asked about his aspirations towards magic, Wayne hesitated, his prior contentment with a mercenary's life now under scrutiny. Our hero found Wayne's admiration puzzling, aware that his exceptional abilities stemmed from daily battles for survival, not a desire to instruct or inspire others. Recognizing his position as an outsider, he refrained from offering false hope. Yet he acknowledged Wayne's leadership skills, suggesting they surpassed his own and hinted that entrepreneurial success required consultation with Jenny for those genuinely interested. As the moment to part ways approached, the captain noting our protagonist's presence offered a respectful bow in gratitude, acknowledging the significant impact of our hero's actions. Brett weighed on our hero as he witnessed the plight of the Crimber populace, yet he recognized the limitations of his influence in alleviating their suffering. The captain, seasoned in the mercenary trade, acknowledged the harsh reality that their profession often culminates in life or death outcomes. Following their mission's completion, the captain proceeded to verify the status of the servers, confirming their operational integrity as part of their assigned duties. Our protagonist inquired about the possibility of collecting vampire blood samples. For analysis by Jenny, Kromgar responded promptly, assuring that the request would be fulfilled and mentioned the pending compensation for our hero's services. He revealed that all financial transactions were now directed through Jenny, advising our hero to consult her for the payment. Krumgar expressed his astonishment at our hero's exemplary performance, 
which exceeded his expectations and solidified our protagonist's reputation as a consummate professional. He urged our hero to consider future collaborations, highlighting his own adeptness as both a leader and a businessman. Despite deciding to part ways, our hero reflected positively on the experience, acknowledging Kramgar's exceptional leadership and business acumen. Kitty, observing our protagonist, inquired of the captain about the possibility of collaboration. The captain, however, dismissed the idea with a laugh, acknowledging that our hero's capabilities far exceeded their own. He admitted never encountering anyone of such caliber and doubted the existence of a company capable of employing our hero on a full-time basis due to the formidable costs involved. Kitty persisted, expressing concern over finding someone of our hero's exceptional skills and the uncertainty of his allegiance in future encounters. The captain countered, humorously noting Kitty's tendency to favor nearly every new acquaintance, but concurred on the unpredictability of our hero's future allegiances. They both recognized the impracticality of securing such a powerful ally, leaving their hope and fortune for future endeavors and encounters. Upon arriving at the bar, our hero was greeted by his acquaintance and Jenny. He was introduced as a partner, a title he modestly declined, expressing a desire for a different kind of recognition. Unfamiliar with the concept of popularity, our hero was momentarily perplexed. It was then that Deadpool mentioned Jenny's satisfaction with his efforts, only to be humorously silenced by a tap on the head. Jenny quickly shifted the conversation to inquire about our hero's recent engagement with Kremer's squad, to which our hero replied that it was less challenging than previous encounters, notably the factory incident with Kraken, and that the adversaries posed no significant threat. Jenny's curiosity peaked at the mention of a battle with a retired soldier, repeatedly known for overseeing Area 51, expressing admiration for such a feat. Deadpool seizing the moment, highlighted the often underestimated strength of seemingly minor characters like janitors, suggesting that their potential should not be overlooked. This insight led our hero to contemplate the hierarchy of power, recognizing the stark contrast between ordinary combatants and their leaders, especially those of significant renown. Jenny conveyed concerns about engaging with certain powerful entities, hinting at the formidable nature of those our hero was advised to avoid. She also revealed the buzzing interest around him following his latest missions, indicating a surge in demand for the Lightning Wizard. Presenting a comprehensive list of pending assignments, Jenny's look conveyed a plea for his continued involvement. Despite Reed's attempt to interject, Jenny's command of the situation was unchallenged, culminating in a complimentary cocktail for our hero, while a humorous exchange about the cost of drinks unfolded with Dylan. Returning home, our hero grappled with the aftermath of the Viper's influence recognizing the necessity to forgo alcohol to mitigate its enduring effects. This realization marked a pivotal moment in his journey, underscored by the newfound demand for his unique talents and the discreet guidance from Jenny. Exhausted and yearning for rest, our hero's resolve was tested as he recalled the ledger of tasks and Jenny's reminder of their temporal nature with only one mission selectable. Surveying the list, he initially found only modest propositions until a peculiar invitation from the cleaners caught his eye. Skeptical given his history of opposition to them, he soon recognized it as Jenny's playful ruse. Delving deeper, he identified a compelling offer from a pharmaceutical entity, recalling his recent visit to their site. Intrigued by their product, Stimonia, an elixir priced at 100 million rubles known for its stamina-enhancing qualities, he saw parallels to their previous offerings. Despite the allure of more glamorous ventures, our hero was pragmatic, prioritizing the need for a solution to his physical ailments over the pursuit of wealth or fame, opting for the pharmaceutical company's mission. He contemplated the broader benefits of such a partnership beyond mere financial gain. With a hopeful heart, he envisioned this collaboration not only as a means to address his immediate needs, but potentially as a remedy for his insomnia, marking the beginning of a mutually beneficial alliance. Exhausted, our hero's attention was momentarily captured by an intriguing message regarding an upcoming assembly of the Sovereign Nomos in the Balkans. Within a week, he embarked on a mission to apprehend notorious criminals, seizing the opportunity to refine his magic-infused marksmanship. This endeavor provided insight into his current capabilities and the potential for enhancement through advanced magical practices. Recognizing the augmentation his weapons received from simple spells, he aspired to master a distinctive class of magic, the ciliary magic, for its strategic advantages in combat, despite its complexities beyond his current mastery. Subsequently, our hero ventured into a familiar bar where Jenny awaited. Her immediate inquiry into his well-being and preparedness for the pharmaceutical assignment caught him off guard. Jenny's knack for predicting his interests never ceased to amaze him. Acknowledging his intent to collaborate with the pharmaceutical company, Jenny hinted at a potential visit from a representative of the organization, suggesting a pivotal meeting was imminent. Her astute observations, 
and the seamless alignment opportunities underscored a confluence of events, steering our hero towards his next venture with a sense of anticipation and readiness for the challenges that lay ahead. Approached with curiosity, our hero was questioned about Jenny's affiliation with him. In response, he sought clarification on the stranger's familiarity with him. The man identified our hero as the renowned lightning magician, whose exploits had become the talk of the town, especially his penchant for hunting and accumulating wealth. Acknowledging the truth in these observations, our hero sensed an oddity in the man's demeanor. Nevertheless, the stranger articulated that hunting in the Balkans is driven by two distinct motivations, the desperation of dire circumstances or a genuine passion for the hunt, undeterred by the risks involved. This conversation illuminated the diverse motivations behind hunting, emphasizing the fine line between necessity and thrill-seeking in the perilous dance with danger. As our hero was poised to inquire the stranger's identity, an unexpected gesture unfolded. The individual, in a dramatic turn, launched a card directly towards him, which to our hero's astonishment, halted just before making contact. Grasping the card, our hero learned the man identified himself as Sebastian, sharing a professional kinship with Jenny. Though the exact nature of his work remained enigmatic, our hero, puzzled by the display of what appeared to be telekinesis, speculated on the extent of Sebastian's abilities, which Sebastian himself left shrouded in mystery, offering only hints and leaving space for curiosity. Sebastian's admission of having received training abroad piqued our hero interest further. Amidst these revelations, Jenny came and expressed her displeasure, perturbed by Sebastian's forthrightness and its unsettling effect on our hero. She urged for a moment of calm, signaling a complex web of relations and secrets entwined within their interactions. This encounter left our hero contemplating the connections and undercurrents of power that seemed to play around him, marking yet another layer to unravel in his ongoing journey. Sebastian's visit was, in essence, a professional courtesy as he presented his visvica upon arrival, signaling his intent for a formal discussion. This gesture, initially misunderstood, sparked Jenny's curiosity about the nature of his visit. Upon receiving a peculiar document from Sebastian, Jenny was taken aback by the announcement of an upcoming gathering. The revelation that this event was scheduled sooner than anticipated, extending over two months, stirred a mix of shock and frustration in her. The news that such gatherings were infrequent, yet now seemingly propelled by an advocate within the city council, added layers of intrigue and urgency to the situation. Her hero piecing together the conversation with his recent reading, recognized they were discussing the anticipated delegation from the Sovereign Philharmonic to the Balkans. This connection hinted at a significant mobilization of private entrepreneurs at the behest of city governance, a development that, judging by Jenny's and Sebastian's grave expressions, carried considerable weight and implications for the community. The gathering of these insights framed a scenario of complex political and social dynamics, with our hero standing at the intersection of unfolding events, poised to navigate the challenges of this emergent, serious predicament. After their discussion, Sebastian prepared to depart, offering a parting handshake to our hero with an enticing proposal. He suggested that should our hero ever seek alternative employment opportunities, Sebastian's offer would surpass what Jenny could provide in terms of remuneration. Despite Jenny's playful chiding of Sebastian's persuasive eloquence, she did not contest his claim. She even hinted that our hero might eventually need to explore options beyond their current collaborations. This left our hero pondering the depth of their partnership and Jenny's openness to letting go, reflecting on the transient nature of alliances. Prompted by our hero's inquiry about the impending task, Jenny was momentarily distracted by her phone, suggesting an imminent revelation. It was at this juncture that a slight man with spectacles entered, seeking Jenny. Without hesitation, Jenny ushered both men into a concealed chamber within the bar, a move that took our hero by surprise. Unbeknownst to him, the bar harbored a secret room, a detail that piqued his curiosity and hinted at the layers of intrigue enveloping their operations. This turn of events promised an unfolding adventure, blending mystery with the allure of the unknown. In a brisk exchange devoid of unnecessary pleasantries, Jenny swiftly transitioned from her dialogue with our hero to greet the newcomer, introducing herself to the spectacled man. He revealed his identity as Lewin Seiji, the sales manager at Imnek, a burgeoning entity in the pharmaceutical landscape engaged in a critical mission. With the essence of time pressing against them, Lewin wasted no moments diving into the heart of the matter. Amnek, despite its modest size, has embarked on the ambitious project of developing neurostabilizers, buoyed by optimistic projections of transformative success upon completion, yet shadowed by the unethical practices of the district administration's intent on usurping patents through clandestine collaborations with criminal elements. The stakes were high. Our hero now entrusted with a mission of paramount importance, listened intently as Lewin unveiled the precarious situation. The dilemma Amnek faced was not just an innovation, 
but in securing the rightful ownership of their breakthrough. The Xingtan neurostabilizer, though ready, lingered in limbo, unauthorized for further development due to bureaucratic entanglements. Lewin's plan to clandestinely forward the sample to the intellectual property office was jeopardized by a leak threatening to expose their efforts to the voracious appetites of the district's administration. This revelation set the stage for our hero's involvement, outlining a narrative of intrigue, intellectual property battles, and the quest for justice within the pharmaceutical frontier. Our hero discovered the item was stored in the warehouse, convinced that the contract with the corporation specified a sole condition. The sample must be submitted to the intellectual property office within two days. Thus, he had merely 36 hours to act. The corporation insisted the sample be placed in approximate location necessitating its immediate retrieval. The notion of absconding with the sample crossed his mind, yet he recognized the adverse implications it would have for all parties involved. Additionally, confronting the adversaries became inevitable. He unveiled their lack of a concrete strategy, as their plans were often improvised. Inquiring about their numbers, he was informed, including the red one, there are 15. Without hesitation, he commanded the sealing of the entrance and the formation of three surveillance teams to monitor the area, stipulating that any unusual activity be reported to him directly. Our hero contemplated engaging with the adversaries but ultimately decided against it. Instead, he opted to survey the entire area, pondering the rationale behind concealing everything in such a location. Observing the wall, he noted its considerable height yet apparent fragility, a concerning vulnerability. He then employed the Claymore ability, a magical skill capable of triggering explosive mines and inflicting substantial damage, albeit within a limited radius. Recognizing the diminished efficacy against numerous foes, our hero elected to adapt his strategy by not amplifying the power but rather extending the effective range. Having successfully adjusted his approach, the next phase involved deploying these strategic fields across various locations. In a sudden turn of events, hostile maids approached our hero, collapsing at his feet to express their apologies for their actions. Our hero, with a reassuring demeanor, urged them not to fret. One of them, eager to make amends, inquired about ways to redeem himself. Star Hero speculated that the individual's anxiety stemmed from the fear of retribution post-mission. He offered a resolution, suggesting a path towards normalcy, contingent on the individual's commitment to restrain from emotional displays in public. The proposition puzzled the young man, yet our hero implied that understanding would dawn in time, emphasizing the importance of self-representation in future encounters. He advised employing the same formidable tactics against adversaries as had been used against him. Meanwhile, our hero stationed himself in the hangar, resorting to vipers for sustenance as his energy waned. The scarcity of vipers indicated that extending the confrontation was impractical. Nonetheless, he was consoled by the availability of his firearm, a steadfast ally in dire straits, while he contemplated a final inspection of his weapon. External disturbances disrupted his solitude. Our hero utilized his scouting ability to detect enemy gang leaders within a two-kilometer radius, instantly revealing their positions. Emerging onto the street, one of his allies attempted to signal a warning, but our hero had already comprehended the situation. He deduced that the rapid approach of their adversaries was too swift for ordinary humans, suggesting either the use of magic or vehicles, which indeed was the case. The team was alerted to prepare for the imminent threat. Understanding the importance of morale, our hero moved to the forefront, instructing his team to secure the entrance while he handled the remaining challenges. Just then, a defiant adversary appeared at the front line, our hero recognized that his intimidation tactics had been effective, yet he was puzzled by the bandit's solitary stance at the gate. He contemplated the possibility of an alternate entry point, but it was already too late. The enemies had executed their plan. Our hero was uncertain whether their goal was merely to breach the defenses. The anticipation only heightened for our hero, confident that the adversaries would be taken aback by the potency of the claymore. Astonishingly, a vehicle that had breached the wall was launched airborne, landing near our hero. Initially, he was amazed at the enhanced effectiveness of his ability but soon realized it was the adversary's unique fuel that augmented the Claymore's impact. Aware of the potential for deceitful tactics, our hero was prepared to counter any betrayal. Suddenly, two enigmatic figures materialized before him, shrouded in smoke yet emanating a distinct aura, signaling their formidable presence. Among them, our hero discerned a magician identifiable by a unique energy signature. Our hero found himself face to face with the magician for the third time that day, Sparking intrigue. Unlike the others, this magician exuded a unique aura, suggesting he could be the gang's leader, which only added to the hero's curiosity. However, understanding the urgency of his mission took precedence over his desire for knowledge. Implementing a strategic network across the territory, our hero discovered the defeat of many adversaries. He then questioned the remaining bandits about their duration of stay. While they devised their strategy, 
our hero instructed his team to shield their eyes and prepare to fire upon the bandit's entry. This directive puzzled his allies, but there was no time for detailed explanations. Midst a heated discussion regarding the command, the plan was executed flawlessly. The bandits were caught off guard and incapacitated by blindness, allowing our hero's team to launch an effective assault. Amidst the chaos, the bandits found themselves ensnared, vocalizing their predicaments or crying out from the excruciating sensation as though their eyes were under immense pressure. Unbeknownst to them, the catalyst of their turmoil, a figure shrouded in flames, had already infiltrated their ranks, instilling dread with his sudden appearance, positioned at a distance. Our hero weighed the consequences of revealing his magical prowess against the imperative to decisively vanquish his foes. Opting for the latter, he unleashed a torrent of chain lightning, neutralizing an additional cohort of adversaries. Observing the frenetic exchange of gunfire, he contemplated his contribution to the skirmish. Yet recognizing the minimal necessity for his intervention, his attention pivoted towards the two masterminds, who in a twist of fate, were simultaneously considering our hero's influence on the battlefield. The adversaries were taken aback by the prowess of such a formidable warrior, given their knowledge that Amnak lacked the resources to employ a magician of notable skill. This revelation spurred a mix of astonishment and inquiry regarding the identity and origins of our hero. Their interest peaked further when they noticed our hero's composed demeanor, marked by a confident smile directed at them. Then, an individual known as the Razor Man approached our hero, inquiring about the fate of their leader, oblivious to the broader chaos that unfolded as his allies succumbed to their injuries. To him, these losses were inconsequential. He viewed his comrades as expendable. In a surprising turn, the Razor Man proposed an end to their confrontation. His attempt to recite a verse was abruptly silenced by the magician, prompting a query about the prohibition against casual conversation, underestimating our hero's resilience against their assault. The magician, maintaining his gravitas, warned the razor man of the necessity to reassess his role should he fail to cease his trivial banter. Upon overhearing the exchange, our hero deduced that the magician was not allied with the gang. Instead, the group's leader, who sought an advantageous exit, aligned with whichever side promised greater benefits. This revelation prompted our hero to sigh, recognizing the universality of self-interest. However, his visible amusement did not sit well with the Razor Man, who, disliking the hero's relaxed demeanor, urged the magician to expedite our hero's defeat. The magician, sharing this sentiment, began to emanate a hostile aura. Observing the magician's technique, our hero noted the precision and energy flow in his magic, which inspired an epiphany about crafting a flawless defensive barrier. It became evident that creating an ideal escape route required more than passive resistance. Movement and strategy were essential. Our hero's swift action to shatter the shield left the mage visibly dismayed and taken aback. The Razor Man, however, found amusement in this turn of events, perceiving our hero's lack of deference towards them as audacity. In a heated moment, the magician, losing his composure, berated our hero, questioning his legitimacy as a magician. Our hero unfazed and with his firearm still aimed, queried whether being labeled a magic user is meant to be derogatory. The magician, Stumped for a rebuttal, redirected his frustration towards the Razor Man, critiquing his understanding of magical combat. The Razor Man, indifferent to the magician's plight, mocked him, suggesting fear had overtaken the magician from just a single gunshot, highlighting that our hero had yet to even employ magic. He speculated that our hero might possess mastery over light or darkness, noting that such magicians often emit a glow when casting spells. Upon hearing the observation about his potential mastery over light or darkness, our hero's understanding deepened. He recognized the potency of light magic, balanced by the necessity for intense focus to prevent self-impairment, given the visible cues that accompany spellcasting, acknowledging his proficiency in magic. Our hero playfully conceded to being a skilled magician. The Razor Man then warned of an immediate counterattack upon witnessing any spellcasting, inadvertently revealing his fangs. This moment reminded our hero of a prior discussion with Jenny, probing for any hidden challenges in the mission, especially about a ringleader rumored to possess unique mixed lineage potentially explaining the present aggression. Seizing the moment to inject a bit of levity and perhaps disconcert his adversaries, our hero feigned ignorance of the immediate threat, jesting about the distinct, unpleasant scent of unwashed wool emanating from his opponent. He inquired with a hint of sarcasm about the last time the Razor Man had bathed, cleverly using the moment to gather his thoughts and assess the situation further. In response to our hero's provocations, the demeanor of the man with the shaved head shifted dramatically. He issued a warning that if our hero persisted in speaking out of turn, he would personally ensure his silence. Without warning, his physique began to undergo a startling transformation, morphing into the formidable figure of a werewolf. This revelation aligned with our hero's knowledge. Beings with the capacity to adopt animal forms are renowned for their unparalleled brutality and unmatched physical prowess. 
However, the werewolf before him deviated from the norm. With a formidable jaw incapable of containing its drool, misshapen claws, and sparsely distributed fur revealing patches of skin beneath. It was evident that this creature bore the signs of mixed heritage. This unique combination of traits suggested a complexity and depth to the werewolf's lineage, distinguishing him from his purely blooded kin. They were wolf articulated a challenge, though our hero remained unfazed, playfully suggesting the creature struggled with self-control. Given the limitations of its altered vocal apparatus, he further quipped about its potential cognitive challenges, which clearly ruffled the shapeshifter's fur. Suddenly, the distance between them vanished, bringing them face to face. Fortunately, our hero was shielded by a barrier he had erected beforehand, which absorbed the werewolf's aggressive onslaught. Not content with a single line of defense, our hero constructed additional shields, layering them for enhanced protection. This strategic deployment caught the magician off guard. Our hero's ingenuity lay in the shield's design, consisting of five robust layers capable of withstanding even the most formidable assaults. He took pride in this achievement, confident in the unexpectedness of his ability to repel continuous attacks, much to the adversary's surprise. Positioning the revolver against the werewolf's throat through the barrier, our hero declared it was his turn to act. Amplifying the weapon's power, he discharged a round that propelled the werewolf backward. The shot induced a state of panic in the shapeshifter, who hadn't anticipated such a formidable counterattack. Understanding the critical nature of maintaining the upper hand, our hero executed a series of shots. Despite the werewolf's pleas for mercy, the bullets were lethal. To ensure the adversary was unequivocally vanquished, our hero unleashed his thunderbolt spell rendering the werewolf to nothing more than ash. With the werewolf eliminated, our hero's attention turned to the mage, who had surprisingly refrained from intervening. This observation led our hero to speculate whether the mage had been amassing magical power throughout the confrontation, leaving the next move uncertain. With time on his side, our hero's curiosity prevailed. He sought to uncover the nature of the spell being prepared by the opposing magician. A peculiar aura emanating from the magician's staff caught his attention signaling not just a glow but the presence of a menacing magic known for its prevalence in World 2.0. This magic characterized by its straightforward structure and ease of learning packed a significant punch and instilled fear in adversaries. To our hero, it appeared as if the magic could level buildings, sparing only the epicenter. Unwilling to let the situation unfold without intervention, our hero embarked on a bold maneuver to siphon off the magician's mana. The magician was baffled by our hero's audacity unaware that the intent was to hijack control over the magical flow and divert the impending strike towards the ceiling. The magician, however, merely chuckled as the anticipated attack never materialized. Inquiring whether our hero had employed a specific artifact in his defense, he revealed a hint of confusion, suggesting a disconnect in their understanding of the confrontation's dynamics. The magician grappling with disbelief confronted our hero asserting that no mere freelancer for a pharmaceutical company could wield such formidable power. He vocally questioned how our hero could have acquired an artifact of such immense strength, suggesting that perhaps our hero was nearing the limits of his mana reserve. The purpose of his inquiry seemed ambiguous. Was it merely a ploy to distract our hero, or did he genuinely believe that an external object was the source of such extraordinary capabilities? Even after witnessing the downfall of the werewolf, transformed into nothingness, the magician harbored doubts about the true extent of our hero's power, suspecting it might be artifact-enhanced. Upon reflection, our hero recognized the magician's own insecurities, the wild gaze, trembling hands, and perspiration betraying a man on the brink of collapse, tormented by uncertainty. The magician's mind was a battleground of skepticism, especially after the electrifying demise of the werewolf, leaving him to question whether the lightning was truly a manifestation of our hero's strength or merely a stray discharge. Faced with the magician's frantic inquiry for validation, our hero perceived a figure ensnared by his own mistrust, Incapable of reconciling his observations with his fears, the magician's desperation revealed a profound crisis of confidence, marking him not as a formidable adversary, but as an individual overwhelmed by his apprehensions. Realizing he was dealing with someone profoundly out of their depth, our hero couldn't help but remark on the magician's lack of insight. Without further ado, he deployed the newly acquired Shadow Raid skill, unleashing an array of spectral tendrils visible only to the bewildered magician. Engulfed in an ominous sensation, the magician watched in horror as phantom limbs ensnared his hands, the constricting force unyielding until his appendages were severed. His cries of agony broke the silence, questioning the nature of this assault. Our hero, somewhat bemused, wondered if the magician sought an explanation of the technique, rather than expressing incredulity at the attack itself. From the moment they had entered the dimly lit warehouse, our hero had been priming this very ambush. The shadow raid, a power emerging from the wielder's own shadow, 
proved both potent and aptly suited for the environment's low light. The only notable limitation was its preparatory demand, a constraint easily mitigated by the warehouse's shadowy confines, thereby facilitating an unimpeded use of this dark art. The misconception that our hero specialized solely in lightning magic worked to his advantage, as he adeptly manipulated shadows, a testament to his versatility. Despite anticipating a formidable duel, the encounter left our hero underwhelmed, culminating in the mundane and inevitable defeat of the magician. With his revolver trained on the magician's head, eliciting near tears, our hero proposed a deal, answer his inquiries for a chance at survival. The magician, confused yet desperate, was first asked if their group constituted the entire gang. His confirmation relieved our hero, ensuring an unobstructed path to the intellectual property office. In a bid for mercy, the magician professed his utility, boasting a level 3 mage status, suggesting his potential value. Curious, our hero inquired if the werewolf possessed a similar rank, to which the magician affirmed, noting level 3 as a milestone of magical recognition. This exchange not only illuminated the organizational structure and power hierarchy within the gang, but also showcased our hero's strategic acumen in extracting valuable information under duress. Our hero found himself entangled in a conversation that veered into realms beyond his comprehension, yet he grasped the essence. That magician's disputes were not to be settled through mere dialogue. According to the captive magician, a misunderstanding of one's own magical standing was a grave error, one that apparently had left him and another mage in a precarious situation on the ground. When the magician fraught with hope, inquired about the possibility of being spared. Our hero's response was unequivocal and devoid of mercy, underscored by the revolver pressed firmly against the magician's forehead. Despite the magician's pleas, our hero's resolve remained yielding. Forgiveness was not an option. Just as our hero prepared to exit, he was taken aback by the sight of the werewolf, previously thought to be vanquished, standing once again. This unexpected resilience prompted a reassessment of the potency of conventional thunderbolt magic against such beings. Their wolf's survival hinted at the formidable regenerative capabilities influenced by lunar power, leading our hero to ponder the might of pure-blooded werewolves. If a mixed blood could recover with such vigor, the vitality of a pure blood would undoubtedly be far superior. Confronted with this revelation, our hero decisively ended the werewolf's resurgence with another, more potent discharge of lightning, ensuring no further comebacks. This act reinforced our hero's awareness of the stark differences in strength between werewolves of varied lineages as well as the necessity of absolute measures in dealing with such formidable adversaries. The skirmish within the warehouse spanned a brief five minutes, yet the tumult outside suggested an ongoing conflict. Our hero, feeling a sense of responsibility towards his comrades in arms, hesitated neither to linger inside nor to disregard the external fray. Upon retrieving the fallen magician's staff, our hero pondered its significance. Despite its wielders lacking strength, the staff's presence hinted at its utility, rejecting the notion that magical artifacts should be avoided. He decided its potential benefits outweighed any principle of restraint. With the staff in hand, our hero stepped outside to join his allies, ready to lend his power to tip the scales. Employing chain lightning, he dazzled the enemy ranks, not just with the spectacle above, but with the symbolic possession of their leader's staff, effectively declaring dominance. This sight spurred a rapid retreat among the adversaries. Amidst the aftermath as one comrade queried the end of hostilities, others collapsed, drained of vigor from the uneven clash. Notably, the fiery guy among them had exceeded his limits, demonstrating the toll of their outnumbered resistance. Our hero's intervention was not only a display of power, but also a testament to solidarity, as he stood firm with those who had stood by him. Our hero recognized his prowess in combat, acknowledging that while firing flames might seem a basic skill, it was crucial for survival in the fray. It allowed him to stand out without succumbing to the chaos, playing a pivotal role in securing victory, witnessing a comrade in peril yet managing to push his capabilities to their zenith. Our hero saw no merit in reprimand for such valor. Approaching the fiery guy, our hero commended his performance. Meanwhile, he contemplated the staff in his possession, puzzled by its utility. It didn't augment magical power or hasten spellcasting. However, it subtly replenished mana. To our hero, the staff felt like an unwanted beacon of his mage identity, almost as if announcing his presence. Reflecting on discretion, he mused on selecting attire that blended better with the surroundings, prioritizing inconspicuousness in future endeavors. As his team congregated around him, offering their accolades, our hero reciprocated with praise for their collective effort. He then issued directives, ensuring those gravely injured received medical attention, while the unscathed secured their newly won domain. This moment underscored not only the culmination of their struggle, but also the camaraderie and resilience that had led them to triumph. After delegating tasks, our hero found solace in the hangar's quiet observing his trembling hands and the weight of exhaustion bearing down on him. 
Contemplating the use of a whipper to alleviate his fatigue, he quickly decided against it, recognizing the scarcity of such resources and the wisdom in conserving them for dire situations. With the gang's threat neutralized and their allies dispersing to claim their rewards from the pharmaceutical company, a wave of gratitude washed over him from those he had led to victory. Our hero's final task was to deliver the samples to the intellectual property office. Before proceeding, he inquired about acquiring some standard medicines for personal use. The response was encouragingly affirmative, granting him access to whatever he needed. With permission granted, he stocked his bag with an assortment of medicines, including sleeping aids and vitamins, items absent from his home inventory. This act of self-care, albeit small, marked a rare moment of attention to his own well-being amid the chaos of his heroic endeavors. Before departing, our hero paused, his gaze falling upon the staff. Contemplating its value, he speculated that trading it with Jenny might yield enough to procure one or two vipers, a thought that lingered as he settled into the car. Despite the physical toll of his endeavors, a sense of unfinished business propelled him forward, with the promise of rest only after the samples were delivered. The task at hand were not particularly to our hero's liking, yet being within the 10th district provided a semblance of solace. His journey led him to the intellectual property office in District 8, an area whose pristine and serene ambiance struck him profoundly. It felt almost as if he had stepped into a realm reserved for the elite, akin to the mythical temples of lore, prompting an urge to exit promptly. However, as he prepared to leave, an individual approached, inquiring about the purpose of our hero's visit at such a late hour. This unexpected interaction underscored the dichotomy between our hero's rugged experiences and the polished exterior of the city's administrative heart, hinting at the complexities of navigating a world where battles are fought in shadows and the corridors of power alike. Our hero swiftly responded to the inquiry, stating his business with the authorities and probing whether special permission was necessary. The stranger's comment about a great scheme left our hero puzzled, suggesting the elder was no ordinary individual. His presence in such a prestigious area and his willingness to engage in conversation hinted at an underlying significance, perhaps linked to authority or influence. Sensing the complexity of the situation, our hero deemed it wise to disengage cautiously, aiming to exit the interaction without making a lasting impression. However, he noticed the man's attention was fixated not on him, but on the staff he carried. Seizing this moment, our hero playfully inquired, if the man had enjoyed the spectacle he orchestrated the previous day, implying it was designed to captivate even distant onlookers. When our hero ventured a guess, addressing the man as a town counselor, the elder's smile confirmed a recognition of sorts. This exchange subtly underscored the old man's awareness of our hero's recent endeavors, revealing a layer of complexity to their encounter that went beyond mere chance. Planting the staff into the ground, our hero declared his intention to return it, suggesting its significance to someone the elder evidently valued. The old man's inquiry about our hero's depth of knowledge hinted at a broader connection, yet for our hero, piecing together the elder's identity was straightforward, deducing his status as the city councillor based on his unique freedom and presence. Surprisingly, the councillor chose to meet personally, rather than dispatching emissaries. His reflections on the fallen magician painted a picture of a valued friend rather than merely a skilled mage, underscoring a bond strengthened through mutual support and shared endeavors. Initially, our hero braced for a confrontation, suspecting a quest for vengeance. However, a closer examination revealed no animosity in the counselor's gaze, only a profound sense of loss. The proposal that followed took our hero aback, an offer of allegiance grounded in the recognition of our hero's extraordinary capabilities. The counselor, witnessing the night's electrifying events, saw potential for our hero to rise above the fray suggesting a partnership that promised mutual prosperity and a safeguard against the isolation that power often brings. This unexpected turn of events opened a new chapter for our hero, one where alliances formed in the wake of conflict could pave the way to unforeseen opportunities and challenges. In a moment of contemplation, our hero absorbed the counselor's proposition, discerning an increasing display of self-interest woven through his words. The counselor's wealth, acclaim, and access to exceptional talents were evident, marking him as an individual of significant influence. Yet for our hero, such attributes did not justify encumbering himself with obligations of power. Seeking clarity, our hero inquired into the counselor's motives, questioning the necessity of his involvement. The disparity in their needs was apparent. Our hero saw no compelling reason to align with the counselor's ambitions. This inquiry was not just a quest for understanding but a test of the counselor's vision, and the potential role our hero could play within it challenging the premise that power and recognition were adequate enticements for partnership. The possibility of crossing paths with the counselor again loomed large for our hero, especially under the auspices of a more favorable position, 
should the counselor's interest in his talents hold genuine. Jenny's insights into the advantages of establishing connections with influential figures from the board underscored the practical benefits such associations could offer. Contrasting sharply with mere complaints, our hero pondered Jenny's words, recognizing a vein of truth in her experiences. The rarity of proficient magicians, coupled with her successful venture into entrepreneurship, highlighted her acumen. Indeed, not every individual could navigate the complexities of opening a business and functioning as a broker with such adeptness. Interrupting their discussion, Jenny received a phone call, confirming that Omnek had processed the registration for their upcoming journey, and the payment had been successfully transferred. This news not only signaled the commencement of new endeavors, but also the effective management and completion of their current mission. Showcasing the seamless integration of magical prowess and entrepreneurial spirit in navigating their world. Before departing, Jenny halted our hero. Probing about alternative revenue streams, his silence led her to surmise the absence of such, prompting her to stress the importance of establishing a legitimate front to avert unwelcome scrutiny. An unemployed individual with substantial funds would invariably attract the tax authorities' gaze. Our hero assured her of his intent to address the issue, even as Jenny's admonitions about securing employment echoed after him. Stepping out into the evening, weariness weighed heavily on our hero, his thoughts turning to the necessity of replenishing his stock of stimulants for sustained agility amidst relentless fatigue. His path led him to the familiar garden of the elder he had encountered previously. The old man's warm reception belied his earlier uncertainty about our hero's renown and intentions. An apology for past misconceptions was quickly offered, revealing a newfound respect for our hero's adeptness at navigating life's challenges. Inquiring about the elder's initial reservations, our hero learned that rumors had not prepared the old man for the reality of his adaptability. The conversation shifted towards the acquisition of Vipers, a request met with eager anticipation by the elder, recognizing the opportunity for business with such a distinguished guest. Our hero's request for a substantial quantity of Vipers, underscored by a significant sum of money, momentarily staggered the old man, setting the stage for a transaction that bridged past misunderstandings with mutual respect and understanding. Upon witnessing our hero's substantial financial gesture, the elder swiftly transitioned from misunderstanding to admiration, praising our hero evident prospects and regretting his initial discourtesy. With newfound enthusiasm, he offered to showcase premium wares, introducing an array of unfamiliar items that our hero found perplexing. Venturing through the city, weariness enveloped our hero, the day's exertions pushing him to his limits. Reliance on stimulants provided a temporary reprieve, yet he recognized the unsustainability of such dependency. The city's unwelcoming streets tested his resolve, prompting introspection about his capacity to persevere in the face of unrelenting challenges. Eventually returning home, our hero succumbed to exhaustion, granting himself a week of recovery. This period of rest allowed for much-needed physical recuperation and mental reflection. He engaged in stretching to maintain flexibility, mindful nutrition to nourish his body, and meticulous sleep management to restore his energy. This deliberate approach to self-care underscored the importance of balance, preparing him for the demands of the path ahead. Renault, grappling with the fragility of his condition akin to glass, acknowledged the limitations imposed on his physical endeavors. Accustomed to pushing his boundaries, the prospect of seeking part-time employment revealed the harsh reality of his constraints. The necessity to avoid demanding physical labor and night shifts narrowed his options significantly, prompting an exhaustive search for a suitable role. Amidst these challenges, Renault received an inquiry from Jenny about his return to work, adding another layer to his ongoing predicament. Yet, Renault harbored ambitions beyond the immediate need for employment. His curiosity led him to the library, driven by a specific purpose, a to delve into the arcane knowledge of summoning magic rituals, spiritual magic, homunculi creation, and aspects of necromancy. He contemplated the strategic advantage of conjuring a vanguard for combat, envisioning a force comprising werewolves for assault and magicians for support, a combination potentially formidable against adversaries, Renault reasoned that mastering the art of summoning could provide tactical flexibility, allowing for the deployment of spirits or aids to bolster his battle capabilities. This approach presented an alternative to assembling a traditional team, offering a means to explore and extend his magical proficiency. Despite the complexities and risks associated with delving into such esoteric practices, Renault's desire to push his limits and harness the full extent of his powers fueled his determination to explore the untapped potential of magic in combat. Barking on the path of summoning, our hero encountered similarities to the rituals of World 2.0, albeit with added complexity. The ambiguity of summoning specific entities left him pondering the balance between luck and skill. One method required a significant investment with no guarantee of success, while another seemed to hinge on chance, utilizing spiritual power rather than mana, 
akin to the practices of necromancers or shamans. Despite this, he was determined to leverage his magical expertise, unwilling to divert time on uncertain endeavors. Immersed in his studies, an acquaintance interrupted his contemplation, jesting about his prolonged library presence and the pallor of his complexion. Recognizing her from the university, she remarked on his absence from her life and questioned the solitary pursuit of knowledge through books. Her curiosity drew her to a book on necromancy within his collection, leading her to advise against delving into such dark arts if he was at a loss for productive activities. This interaction highlighted the contrast between our hero's deep dive into arcane studies and the perspectives of those around him, underscoring the complexities of navigating a world where magic intersects with everyday concerns and relationships. The girl emphasized that mastering summoning required more than mere talent, suggesting that relying on luck might be as fruitful as purchasing a lottery ticket. She revealed her acquaintance with only three individuals versed in spiritual practices, including a university professor, and urged our hero to reconsider his venture into such arcane arts. Her rationale resonated with our hero, prompting a reflection on the practicality and implications of his pursuits. Despite the allure of revealing the full extent of his magical endeavors, our hero opted for discretion, mindful of the potential repercussions of full disclosure. Her request to share his study session transitioned into a promise to elucidate the complexities and ramifications of summoning magic, intending to dissuade him from its pursuit. Her approach was not merely cautionary but educational, aiming to offer our hero a comprehensive understanding of summoning's challenges and consequences. This gesture of guidance reflected a blend of concern and a desire to influence our hero's path, steering him towards a consideration of the broader impact of his magical explorations. As the conversation meandered through various magical disciplines, our hero couldn't help but regard his interlocutor as a genuinely kind individual. Recognizing his sincere dedication to mastering summoning, she shifted her approach from cautionary to supportive, offering guidance in his solitary journey. This gesture of solidarity was a solace for our hero, accustomed to relying solely on his own resources. However, when she probed for his attention and realized he was lost in thought, her frustration became evident. Her surprise at not knowing his name underscored the impersonal nature of their interaction marking a moment of realization about the depth of their acquaintance. This encounter prompted our hero to tread cautiously with personal disclosures, aware that revealing too much could compromise his anonymity and safety. In response to her query about the importance of his identity, our hero attempted to downplay his presence as merely that of a library patron. Yet her sudden decision to take him under her tutelage, dismissing summoning in favor of fundamental magical principles, set a new course for their relationship. Despite his initial hesitation, the promise of meeting in two weeks for structured learning left no room for negotiation. Her departure, leaving behind a promise of future encounters, marked the beginning of an unexpected mentorship, challenging our hero to balance his quest for arcane knowledge with the basics of magic under her guidance. Reflecting on the encounter, our hero perceived the woman as peculiar yet benevolent. As dust settled, he mused over Ares's inclination towards individuals not solely for their magical prowess, but for their character and potential. Despite initial uncertainties about forging a closer bond, her distinct presence had sparked an interest in him, making the prospect of bi-weekly meetings somewhat appealing. The potential benefits of cultivating a rapport with a magic professor, possibly aiding in job exploration, also dawned on him. Amid these contemplations, our hero committed to balancing his commitments, thought it prudent to organize his schedule more effectively, especially given his promise to a certain individual, which slightly weighed on him. Returning to Jenny, our hero was informed about an advancement. His name would be added to the general database, allowing him to independently accept orders due to the high satisfaction with his work. This development promised to reduce Jenny's workload and underscored the recognition of our hero's efforts. Inquiring about Jordan's whereabouts, Jenny speculated on his periodic returns to a former role, with Jan occasionally filling in. As Jenny served a cocktail, the sudden appearance of Dylan led to an unexpected altercation, illustrating the unpredictable nature of their environment and the complex web of interactions defining their lives. While Jenny scolded Dylan for his negligence, our hero pondered the implications of being registered in the general database. He queried about the benefits and risks associated with this inclusion. Jenny clarified that it posed no risk to him personally. Rather, it was a means to officially record his work outcomes on the network. This system allowed him to set his service rates and specify job preferences, enhancing his autonomy in the market. Jenny highlighted that reaching such a level of recognition typically required at least 10 months, but due to direct client requests. Our hero had accelerated through this timeline. This development had caused some discontent among those outside Jenny's immediate network. Unable to secure our hero's services, Dylan's remark about a particularly ambitious woman seeking to secure exclusive rights to our hero's abilities brought a smile to his face. 
amused by the competitive dynamics at play. Jenny reassured him regarding data registration, describing it as an exploit within the integrated network. Essentially a blind spot not monitored by the government, this explanation served to alleviate concerns about privacy and security, suggesting a layer of operational freedom beneath governmental oversight. Jenny preempted further questions by emphasizing the inevitability of governmental involvement, shedding light on the broader context of their operations and the relative indifference of law enforcement to the fringes of the city where their activities remained unchecked. Our hero contemplating Jenny's inquiry about his preferences for upcoming assignments expressed a desire for tasks that involved unique and scarce magical disciplines, particularly those concerning time and space manipulation or potent regenerative techniques. Additionally, he showed interest in acquiring rare artifacts and elixirs. Jenny expressed skepticism about the feasibility of securing such specialized commissions, even considering our hero's esteemed reputation. Dylan interjected, emphasizing that our hero's preferences were his prerogative suggesting that aspirations and job specifications should align with personal interests and goals rather than perceived limitations. Our hero clarified that his high standards for assignments did not preclude him from undertaking other types of work. Rather, he was setting an aspirational benchmark for the rewards he sought through his contributions. Jenny cautioned that fulfilling such specific requests might take time, advising our hero to refrain from accepting new orders in the immediate future. This conversation illuminated the dynamic interplay between ambition and the pragmatic aspects of magical contract work, showcasing the balance between aspiration and the practicalities of the magical marketplace. Upon learning the potential financial loss from premature registration, our hero pondered the significance of timing in maximizing his profits, the revelation that aligning his registration with optimal pricing could significantly impact his earnings prompted a moment of strategic consideration, especially with aspirations such as corporate acquisition in mind. Dylan's inquiry into our hero's financial needs opened the door to an alternative revenue stream commonly pursued by mercenaries for supplementary income. Intrigued by the prospect of earning substantial daily returns, our hero was led to District 50, home to the city's environmental agency. Amidst the hustle of numerous mercenaries, our hero, now identified as number 484, was briefed on the operational dynamics. He was informed of the importance of memorizing his assigned number for when the call to action came, highlighting his integration into a team of four for upcoming missions. This turn of events underscored our hero's agility in navigating the complex economic and operational landscapes of his world, balancing his lofty ambitions with the practicality of immediate financial opportunities. While our hero preferred the autonomy of solo missions, he recognized the necessity of adapting to collaborative efforts. Dylan's briefing on the hazards beyond District 50 where untamed lands were rife with dangers, including disease spreading wildlife exacerbated by pollution, illuminated the gravity of their task. The government's initiative, offering a reward for each beast eliminated, presented a lucrative opportunity to mitigate these threats while earning significant compensation. Our hero, calculating the financial implications, realized the potential for substantial earnings, though his goal extended beyond the immediate gain of 10 million. It was at this moment that he was approached by a group, signaling the formation of his new team tasked with combating the polluted souls, the inquiry about his identification as number 484 confirmed his assignment, ushering in a new chapter of collaborative endeavor in the battle against environmental and supernatural menaces. Confirming his identity as number 484, our hero, introducing himself as Wonk, exchanged handshakes with his new teammates. The gesture marked the beginning of their acquaintance, setting the stage for mutual introductions. This moment of camaraderie underscored the importance of collaboration and trust among those united by a common mission, even in the most perilous environments. As names were shared, the foundation for their joint venture was laid, heralding the start of a partnership poised to face the challenges that lay ahead in their hazardous undertaking. Iroquan joining forces, our hero was introduced to the team, Miguel, the leader with number 483, followed by Ericsson and Claria. Prompted for their readiness, our hero affirmed their immediate departure. Observing his new companions, he sensed a familiarity among them, a shared understanding of each other's strengths and the essential vigor required for their daunting task ahead. This realization prompted our hero to adopt a stance of cautious involvement, aiming not to impede their established dynamics. Reflecting on their destination, our hero contemplated the neglected outskirts beyond Falcon Metropolis, known colloquially as the disadvantaged neighborhoods. These vast ruinous expanses, once envisioned as burgeoning residential districts, had succumbed to neglect due to unmanageable population surges and administrative oversight failures. The failed ambition to integrate these areas into the urban fold had resulted in their designation as the 55-plus neighborhoods, abandoned and unnamed, tasked with combating the surge in polluter activity near the city's periphery. 
Our hero and his team face the harsh reality of life outside Falcon's protective barriers. These neglected zones, teeming with hazards, underscored the gravity of their mission to stem the tide of encroaching threats, safeguarding the city from the perils lurking just beyond its borders. In a realm of shadows, rumors swirled about numerous intense encounters in the underbelly of the factories, a detail our hero recollected amidst whispers. These establishments were known not just for their industrial outputs, but for crafting devices of destruction tailored for the dark guilds. Miguel, a seasoned mercenary, argued that such perilous zones, often shunned by many, held lucrative opportunities specifically. Bounties reaching a million kel for each corrupted being apprehended. A figure cloaked in mystery gestured towards his shotgun, asserting its efficiency in their grim hunts. A fellow warrior inquired about our hero's choice of armament, hinting at the need for superiority in their arsenal. Our hero, wise to the undercurrents of their conversation, acknowledged the futility of concealment, ready to face the unspoken challenges ahead. Our hero revealed his mastery over lightning magic, a spectacle witnessed by many. This revelation led to speculation. Was he delving into elemental magic? Upon inquiry, he confirmed only to be met with feigned confusion. Questioning their disbelief, Miguel explained their assumption of him utilizing basic magic like Shockwave, noting that solo mages often develop versatile skills for potential team collaboration. The hero found this reasoning peculiar, recalling advice that elemental magic deemed inefficient for teamwork is often discouraged. The implicit rejection seemed premeditated, echoing Miguel's earlier hints at re-evaluating their alliance for the necessity of compatible fire support capabilities. This conversation subtly underscored the complexities of magical skills and group dynamics within their world. Our hero inquired if unity was a prerequisite for compensation. Miguel clarified that while adversities might arise, the absence of a team member wouldn't justify withholding payment. This revelation led our hero to propose individual endeavors henceforth, irritated by Miguel's smug demeanor during the disclosure. The protagonist argued that a prior discussion could have spared them wasted effort, yet Miguel insisted on the impracticality of upfront agreements. Consequently, our hero advocated for separation, emphasizing the folly in revealing one's full potential only to face potential financial losses. As he departed, Mitchell's gaze lingered on him, observed by the team. His inquiries about his concern were met with indifference overshadowed by the nuisance of mandatory companionship and the dread of vigilant oversight. During their quest, the team anticipated that the protagonist would return defeated to the city after several encounters with environmental adversaries. However, Miguel sensed an anomaly. Despite the situation unfolding as he had anticipated, something felt amiss. He realized the departure of our hero might have been a strategic choice rather than a retreat, signifying the loss of a formidable ally. Meanwhile, our hero was actively engaged not in aimless wanderings but in combating the fauna corrupted by pollution. According to information provided by Dylan, this ecological crisis traced back to approximately three years ago, originating from a covert operation to develop biotoxic armaments in an underprivileged region by a nefarious entity. The project's goal was to significantly enhance cellular regeneration through surgical intervention, manipulating viral elements known for their rapid proliferation. This experiment aimed to explore the potential for immortality, but resulted in a horrific disaster due to soul contamination. It's reported that post-contamination, bodily cells proliferate uncontrollably, swell, and burst. The critical issue arises from the remnants, which endlessly roam in search of vital energy, manifesting as a dark fog, the only trace of their former selves. Our hero found the scenario appalling, yet to provide evidence. He was tasked with retrieving a pair of eyeballs, leaving him with no alternative. Upon turning, he became aware of the additional specimens. Finally, he was poised for a direct encounter. Thanks to detection magic, he anticipated the monster's trajectory, ensuring his preparedness. Utilizing a gravity loop, he simultaneously immobilized all the creatures. Several individuals attempted to approach, but a protective barrier surrounded him. Our hero wielded his revolver, decisively dispatching the beasts. Wearied by the escalating challenges, he relentlessly pursued them, the count blurring, Upon eliminating the fifth adversary, he envisaged a reward of five million, considering such earnings not reprehensible, albeit not a sustainable occupation. These foes harbored complexities beyond his anticipation. Their straightforward movements masked formidable velocity and strength. Thus, mercenaries typically mobilize in squads of four for such encounters. Within Miguel's cadre, solitary confrontation with these fiends was deemed insurmountable. They perceived him as a negligible mage, effectively abandoning him to his doom. Yet undeterred, our hero faced these trials with unyielding resolve. Following a brief interlude, our hero resumed his quest for the subsequent target, rejuvenated and his viper replenished. 
His ambition for the mission was to amass at least 20 million in sales, a sum that would ensure a consistent supply of drug stimonium from the pharmaceutical giant statin. To achieve the coveted amount, he needed to capture an additional 15 monsters. Given his current pace, this endeavor would extend over two more days. Amidst this pursuit, he contemplated the possibility of undertaking a different assignment, yet recognized the futility of regrets at this juncture. Utilizing his scanner, he detected three beasts, armed with the optimal spell for deserted locals. He unleashed Scam Lightning, demonstrating his mastery over arcane assaults tailored for such forsaken environments. Our hero, employing principles of summoning magic, crafted his foxes, to yet to achieve autonomy for each, they boasted impressive longevity. As the foxes engaged the wargs, our hero discerned the emergence of a figure, previously undetected, reminiscent of his inaugural mission's surprise. Concluding the newcomer might be the elusive sniper. Our hero deemed a sound wave as the fitting overture for their encounter. Thus, he unleashed a sonic assault targeting the individual. This strategic application of magic underscored his adaptability and tactical prowess, employing environmental advantage and arcane skills to navigate unforeseen challenges. Our hero perceived the escapee's capacity to nullify sound waves. Consequently, he opted for a novel strategy, invoking the Ice Spear spell directed at his adversary, a female. She narrowly avoided the attack, feeling fortunate to have evaded the initial threat. However, she soon found herself facing the spear's subsequent phase. Recognizing the temporal limitation of his advantage, the hero was determined to capture someone of her formidable abilities. He employed the gravity loop technique, effectively immobilizing her hands. Distressed by her predicament, the woman expressed her displeasure, only to be met with a choice posed by the hero. Continue her outcry or take action. With a snap of his fingers, he disarmed her, demonstrating his superiority. Despite her plea for leniency, the hero remained unmoved. Her attempts to clarify her intentions failed to alleviate his suspicions, heightened by her earlier attempt to flee upon his discovery. She insisted her actions were not meant to hinder his pursuits, a claim he found unconvincing as he indulged in his viper smoke. She implored him to alleviate her discomfort, fearing frostbite had set in, a plea that underscored the intensity of their encounter. Your hero were yet discerning, brandished a firearm, compelling her immediate confession. She was in league with Dylan, serving as a mercenary. Her revelation led him to query how she was privy to his knowledge of Dylan, to which she admitted Dylan had disclosed this to him. Further inquiries revealed her origin from anti-race and her mysterious ability to elude magical detection. She insisted her intentions were not malevolent. She merely sought to avoid entanglement in conflicts, arguing that if she desired his demise, she would have initiated an attack. Her avoidance of his scrutiny, she revealed, was aided by an amulet she wore, crafted by a druid, symbolizing a significant investment in her safety. Yet, as she boasted of its value, our hero seized it, scrutinizing the artifact. Her demands for its return met with his contemplation on Jurek de Mekic, a force not characterized by conventional energy, but by the strength derived from belief, leaving no traceable signs. Our hero comprehended the elusive nature of druidic magic, realizing its power diminished over time, particularly as its intricate patterns vanished upon scrutiny. This observation led him to deduce the artifact's functionality as a cloaking device, likely activated during concealment, and its utility constrained by a finite number of uses, rendering it ineffective as a weapon. Despite the item's considerable value, delineated by the woman's request for its return, he remained non-committal, heightening her anxiety. Her distress was compounded by her realization of his ignorance regarding the contents of his own possession. Although she was visibly disconcerted, her attention momentarily shifted to the inconvenience of water-filled boots, a minor aftermath of her icebound predicament. Subsequently, our hero reached out to Jenny, inquiring about a blue-haired mercenary associated with the anti-raise organization, recalling Jenny's prior reference to a mod woman. This interaction, despite the poor communication signal, sufficed for him. Observing the woman's relief, mistakenly believing her life was at peril, he sought her identity. She introduced herself as Camilla, albeit preferring the moniker Imola. Our hero was amused upon learning her name, reflecting on the serendipity of their meeting. Despite her awareness of his reputation, Mila was solely focused on their mutual objective, the extermination of monsters. She proposed a partnership, offering a strategy to efficiently capture multiple adversaries. Mila extended an invitation to collaborate, suggesting they could maximize their hunt by joining forces. She proposed a profit-sharing agreement, initially suggesting a 70-30 split in her favor. Vaughn, valuing his contribution, sought a more equitable share, prompting Myla to adjust the terms to a 640 division. Although Vaughn was intrigued by her proposal, he remained cautious, unaware of her specific plan. Yet he disclosed possessing an artifact that could significantly expedite their quest. 
Upon discovering a mode of transportation, Camilla reassured Vaughn about its reliability, despite his concerns about its stability. Throughout their journey, Vaughn engaged in hunting, an activity that piqued Camilla's curiosity yet she chose to observe in silence. She shared an insight that infected creatures are drawn to life force, hinting at a higher concentration of such beings near populous areas. Vaughn was taken aback by Camilla's adeptness, pondering if their strategy was unique or if other mercenaries shared this approach. Considering the potential overlap in tactics, Vaughn suggested altering their course should no alternative strategy emerge. Camilla, grasping Vaughn's hand, expressed surprise at his haste, revealing she held an advantageous strategy. Their leader's peculiar interest in densely populated areas, which unexpectedly aligned with their current mission. This revelation led Vaughn to realize the depth of their employer's involvement, as Camilla admitted to occasionally undertaking tasks without compensation due to the boss's directives. Recently, they had been instrumental in assisting the local homeless population with relocation efforts, a task uniquely known to them. Camilla highlighted the strategic advantage of this knowledge, significantly diminishing the likelihood of encountering rival mercenaries. This intelligence proved invaluable upon their arrival at a seemingly untouched enclave. The absence of mutants was peculiar, suggesting a recent defense or relocation by her company and its leader. Vaughn suggested exploring the site, but Camilla expressed no need, crediting her employer's directives for her presence. Opting to remain on the outskirts, they anticipated the inevitable emergence of creatures. In time, Camilla's vigilant gaze discerned a group of individuals, with Vaughn tallying 18 in total. Realizing the tactical use of magic as a possible reason for their undetected approach, they swiftly took cover prepared for what might unfold. Camilla inquired about Vaughn's intentions regarding the newly arrived group, questioning whether he would simply allow them to proceed unchallenged. Vaughn, with a sense of resolve, suggested that engagement might be futile. Despite the presence of his acquaintances among them, Camilla found the situation perplexing and instinctively sought her absent weapon only to be reminded by Vaughn of their yet unestablished alliance. Once the dust settled, the group's leader acknowledged Vaughn, querying the nature of Camilla's association with him. Vaughn clarified their recent acquaintance, which seemed satisfactory to the leader. He then informed them that his group had already claimed the area they were about to explore and politely requested Vaughn and Camilla to vacate the premises. At this juncture, Camilla's demeanor shifted dramatically towards aggression, questioning the group's assumptions of authority over unclaimed land. She challenged the notion of dividing territory that rightfully belonged to no one, asserting that the land they stood on was forged by the hands of the destitute who called it home. The leader attempted to clarify, suggesting Camilla might not grasp the full context. Yet she dismissed his explanation, demanding silence and asserting their right to defend the homeless community's sanctuary. Camilla swiftly commanded her allies to ready their weapons, emphasizing the seriousness of their claim. The opposing leader urged caution, advocating for a resolution through dialogue rather than conflict acknowledging their numerical disadvantage against Vaughn and Camilla's preparedness. He believed their group's superior numbers would ensure victory, unaware that Vaughn recognized a strategic advantage in targeting their key figure, potentially turning the tide of an imminent confrontation. Mehran, devoid of any magical prowess, stepped forward upon his superior's cue, expressing his unexpected pleasure in encountering a mercenary from Monteras amidst the desolate land of Plato. Camilla recognized the significance of Mehran's introduction, noting the increasing prominence of his group. Plato, known for their substantial financial resources and their active recruitment of adept combatants, the origin of their wealth remained a mystery, sparking intrigue among the mercenaries. Marin conjectured that the Antares organization had invested considerable effort into the development of these territories, deeming it inappropriate for them to vacate. He proposed a temporary truce, suggesting that should any mutant threats arise, his group would autonomously address them. However, Vaughn was skeptical of their intentions to depart peacefully, anticipating that their standoff could inevitably escalate into conflict. For Camilla, this confrontation transcended mere strategy. It was a testament to her principles. Camilla, puzzled by his abrupt decision, questioned his willingness to forsake their cooperative venture over the pursuit of monstrous trophies. Vaughn advocated for solo endeavors in such scenarios, believing them more efficacious. Camilla, in a bid to detain him, revealed that the amulet he had appropriated was valued at 10 million, offering it as a token of partnership continuation. At that juncture, Vaughn's attention was diverted by the sight of a formidable horde of mutants, converging on their position. Camilla seized this moment to rally Vaughn's spirits, suggesting they could derive entertainment from engaging the approaching threat. Vaughn, however, harbored reservations, perceiving an uncanny aspect to these creatures that hinted at a deeper involvement of unknown parties in the unfolding events. Upon observing Mehran, Vaughn discerned the orchestration of the mutant horde's appearance was their handiwork. He urgently advised Camilla to flee, 
committing himself to confront the imminent threat. As Camilla hastened away, a faction of adventurers attempted pursuit, but Vaughn thwarted their effort by conjuring a formidable chasm, effectively trapping them. Mayron's unexpected attempt to wield magic caught Vaughn off guard, yet it also presented him an opportunity to demonstrate his mastery by nullifying Mayron's magical energy. The trapped adventurers found themselves powerless, their magical abilities stifled, appealing to Vaughn for aid. However, it was Mayoran who realized the extent of Vaughn's capabilities as a master mage, a revelation mirrored in their dawning awareness of their predicament. Meanwhile, Vaughn summoned ethereal wolves to aid Camilla, turning the tide against the mutants and ensuring her safety. This act of support brought her immense relief, yet she couldn't help but feel a profound sense of distress amidst the chaos. Camilla took immediate action against the remaining monsters, showcasing her combat prowess. Mayoran, the first to escape the trap, realized his defeat and swiftly retreated, recognizing the vast disparity in power between himself and Vaughn. The other mercenaries, however, expressed their discontent as they emerged from the pit, accusing Vaughn of indifference for not lending aid. Vaughn responded with bemusement, stating his priority was to assist only those truly in need, subtly hinting at Camilla's exception due to her unique armament. This response did not sit well with one particularly disgruntled mercenary who initiated a physical altercation. Vaughn, reluctant to tolerate such insolence, resorted to a recently acquired spell of light magic. The spell's execution was flawless, rendering the aggressor incapacitated on the ground, followed by the immediate activation of a magical charge against him. The adversary's outcry of agony was brief, swiftly succumbing to unconsciousness. The members of his group were taken aback, critiquing Vaughn for not disclosing his formidable abilities sooner, which would have deterred their challenge. Vaughn, with a hint of irony, clarified his presence was for the hunt, not to showcase or receive preferential treatment. He suggested they proceed independently henceforth. However, a dissenting voice emerged from a female member advocating for a second chance. Camilla swiftly countered, insinuating the woman's desire to forsake her allies for personal gain, highlighting her apparent intention to align closely with the mage. The woman, visibly disheartened by Camilla's rebuke, was reminded that the circumstances were far from conciliatory. The fallen man, upon regaining composure, acknowledged his defeat without resentment, profoundly affected by Vaughn's display of power. In a gesture of truce, he offered Vaughn a card representing the Plato mercenaries, indicating a cessation of their dispute over the mutants. Vaughn accepted the gesture, and the group departed signaling an end to the immediate conflict. After the squad's departure, Camilla presented her business card, albeit smeared with the remnants of the mutants. Vaughn suggested they swiftly vacate the vicinity. Arriving at the exit, they tallied their earnings. Vaughn had achieved 12 objectives, while Camilla had secured 7. He encouraged her not to be disheartened, commending their collective effort as commendable. Camilla expressed admiration for Vaughn's magical prius and suggested he visit their office, mentioning Dylan's frequent references to him. As she departed, promising a future encounter, Vaughn proceeded to calculate his earnings, amounting to approximately 19 million. Though short of his 20 million target, this sum sufficed for his medicinal needs. Upon returning home, Vaughn dedicated himself to enhancing his barrier, having prepared the necessary components in advance. The next step involved participating in an auction for Simonia, a venture fraught with high stakes as competitors aggressively bid. Vaughn's winning bid brought a mixture of relief and apprehension, aware of the potential repercussions associated with the karma system. Despite the risk of adverse effects from an overdose, he remained hopeful that the Simonia would ameliorate his condition. Vaughn's body reached its limits, resisting the urge to manipulate mana in his weakened state. His priority was to maintain consciousness and fortify his physical resilience. Remaining alert and hydrated was crucial through the night. Despite consuming stamina, no immediate improvement was evident, yet his blanket bore the brunt of the process, tainted by toxins. This purification hinted at the stamina's efficacy, suggesting its value if it indeed facilitated recovery. This is the end. Leave a comment our hero below, if you want us to do next part.